My best friend Tasman is the most popular girl in school. You know the type. Pretty, rich family, the kind of girl who has everything. I guess some would say she's a spoiled brat. I mean, she's pretty nasty to people, and her mood swings are so unpredictable. Plus, she likes to pick on everyone. But luckily for me, we've been friends since we were little, so I knew she'd never treat me as badly as the other kids. But she didn't exactly treat me nicely either. In fact, most of the time, I felt like her maid. But there were good days too, where she was the greatest friend ever, buying me stuff and even taking me to her fancy country club on the weekends. But when she got cranky, oh my god, I bore the brunt of it. She'd yell at me and complain about every little thing I did, and then she'd order me around. I was like her little stress ball or something. One time, she realized her gym clothes were wet, so she made me swap with her, so she could wear my dry ones. It looked like I'd peed my pants, and everyone laughed at me. She didn't even stick up for me. It was like she used me so she could shine even more. Whenever we hung out with boys, she'd drag me along, but didn't let me know beforehand, so I'd show up looking sloppy, and by that way, she'd look amazing next to me. She clearly didn't want me to get any attention. One day, I put makeup on, and she said I looked like a clown. And then there was the time she wanted to date this guy, but he would only date her if she brought a friend for his brother. So she brought me, and oh my god, his brother was such a weirdo. It was awful. I could handle her, though. And compared to the other kids at school, who had it much worse, I was okay. I felt bad for them, and wished I could stand up to her and protect them, but I wasn't brave enough. To be honest, it wasn't just because I didn't have the courage to stand up to her, it was also because there were way too many advantages of being her friend. She was always generous and gave me all her old clothes, even if she'd only worn them once. She had this super cute skirt, but then she saw another girl wearing it and immediately gave it to me. She gave me a brand new pair of high heels that she said made her legs look fat. Honestly, most of my pretty clothes and shoes came from her, and she always brought me gifts back from her family's luxury vacations. But despite all this, I couldn't ignore the slight resentment I felt towards her. And, okay, there's a bigger reason why I put up with how unfairly she treated me. You see, Tasman has a twin brother called Trevor, and I had a major crush on him! Hanging out with Tasman meant I got to see Trevor more often. Compared to his sister, Trevor was so chilled, but sometimes he was quite cold, even slightly mysterious. So that's why they didn't really get along. Tasman always said mean things about him behind his back. Things like how he was just so lame and such a grandpa. But one time, I almost messed things up while hanging out at their house. Trevor was chilling and playing guitar out on the patio by himself, so I pretended to wander around then approached and complimented him. But Tasman caught sight of that while looking out from the kitchen. Afterwards, she grabbed me and said, Hey, what was that? Did you just flirt with my brother? Ew, uh, do you have some kind of crush on him? Don't you dare. If you do, then our friendship is over right now. I was so shocked at how she reacted, so I quickly denied it and said, Ew, come on, your brother is gross. I hoped she couldn't tell I was lying. After that incident, I told Tasman I had to go home, as I had some crafts to finish. She just burst out laughing and said crafting was for losers. It really upset me though because I loved doing DIY stuff, and my cousins and the kids next door had asked me to start teaching them how to do it. My one cousin had even persuaded me to start making videos on it. So even though Tasman thought it was totally uncool, I still went ahead and secretly started a YouTube channel to share my DIY tutorial videos. The kids on my street all loved it, and pretty soon, I had quite a few subscribers. Then I took it a step further, and made hand puppets of some popular cartoon characters and started doing puppet show videos. Slowly but surely, my channel started to pick up speed. There was one viewer with an account called Cherry Pie that was always the first to leave a comment. She'd even DM'd me on my channel's Twitter account, and we started talking almost every day after that. One day, I decided to make a video to properly introduce myself to my channel's viewers, but I was too shy to show my face, so I did it with the puppets instead. 
The audience seemed to be more interested when I talked about my own life, and so I started telling them about my family and friends, and of course, that included Tasman. But I changed everyone's names to fun nicknames and changed my voice a bit so no one would recognize me. I started to talk a lot about Tasman and how she tortured me and the other kids. I gave her a horrible voice that sounded like a monster and even showed how she would laugh at what people were wearing. I got so into it that I started to make stuff up, like saying how she stole other kids' lunch money, made them do homework for her, and made them buy her snacks during each recess. She always acted like she was some kind of queen. I realized how many feelings I'd buried deep inside me over the years, and now I had this creative outlet to release them all. I even shared the story of when Tasman got dumped by her ex-boyfriend and how she tried to get him back and turned up on his doorstep. He was with his new girlfriend, and she started clinging to his ankle, begging him to ask her out again. Tasman would die if she knew I'd shared this, but I couldn't stop myself. After uploading that video, I gained so many views and subscribers, it seemed like people could really relate to these stories of mine. But weirdly, my number one fan, Cherry Pie, disappeared. I really missed her, to be honest. A few days later at school, everyone was whispering about my channel, and it quickly became clear that they knew about my videos. How had they found out? But then, to my complete horror, I realized they could see my school uniform in one of the videos, and everyone realized the villain I was talking about was Tasman. She was furious about it, and said she was going to find out which of these losers had done it and make their life hell. I was so terrified, I set all my videos to private and even took a few days off school, as I felt so worried about what would happen if she discovered it had been me. Then one day, Cherry Pie suddenly DM'd me again. I thought she was going to ask about where the videos had gone, but instead she said, Looks like you got what you wished for. Everyone's talking about your channel, and now you're finally in the limelight. Oh. My. God. Did this girl also go to our school? Who was she? It couldn't be Tasman. Could it? I replied with like a hundred questions, asking who she was. Did she know who I was? How did she find me, and what did she want? But I got no reply. But then, a few hours later, I got a message saying, Come outside. What? How creepy! I started to feel scared that maybe I had a stalker or something. I grabbed my pepper spray and headed outside. But instead of some crazy fangirl, Trevor was standing there. Hang on, Trevor is Cherry Pie? He said he'd found out about my channel because one time at their house, I'd been reading the comments on my phone, and he'd passed behind me and caught sight of the name of the channel. He became curious, so he made a fake account so he could watch my videos, and that's when he developed a crush on me and enjoyed watching them regularly. Well, that was until I mentioned his sister and made up all those fake stories about things she'd done. That's how Tasman found out about the videos. She borrowed Trevor's laptop one day and saw it open on his screen. But at least the only person who knows it's my channel is Trevor. He said he was really disappointed in me and thought I was better than that. Then he said he was going to delete his fake account because he didn't want to be a phony liar like me. I was heartbroken. How could I have been such a terrible person? I don't know what to do. Should I confess to Tasman that it was me and apologize to her and Trevor and hope they'll forgive me? Or should I just keep quiet and instead focus on being able to stand up for myself and tell Tasman that it's not okay to pick on people? Being the awesome class president that I am means that it's my job to show this new transfer student, Willow, what's what around here. So, obviously this is the canteen. Heads up, don't eat the stew. Yuck. If you have any trouble finding something, just ask me. Well, I haven't seen you since middle school. What's up? Um, just still the same. Um, okay. Oh, you must be confused, but actually I already know Willow. You see, we went to the same middle school together, but to be honest, we never really talked to each other back then. She seems to still be as quiet as always. Oh, and by the way, I'm Natalie, but you can call me Nat. The next few days, I saw Willow always sitting in a corner of the classroom and doodling. She looked kind of lonely, so being a nice person, I decided to sit and talk to her. 
Hey, Willow. Nice shirt. She just gave me this weak smile, then continued doodling. Ugh, talk about awkward. The best thing I could do was just to stupidly smile back, then swiftly left. I didn't really bother with Willow after that. I mean, I said hi if we passed in the hallway or something, but that was it. But it turns out Willow's introverted tendencies hadn't gone unnoticed by other students. As when we were on our school expedition to the woods, I overheard them talking about her. Do you all think that Willow seems a bit weird? Yeah, you're totally right. One time I asked to borrow her eraser, and she just gave it to me without saying anything. She didn't even look me in the eye, just kept on drawing. It was so strange. Huh? Are they seriously gossiping about a new kid? Yeah, so she might not be too sociable, but people should just learn how to respect someone's personal differences, right? Hey, Willow is new here. I don't think it's very nice of you to gossip like this. Also, she's my friend from middle school, so please stop this. But just wondering, has she always been like this? Um, yeah, I guess. Actually, I was quite surprised to see her in our class. In middle school, her grades weren't that good, so it's kind of odd that she's in the top set with us. I could see the whole group was looking at me with surprised eyes. But hey, that was a few years ago. Now, so maybe she's changed. I quickly corrected myself. Then, a few days later, I was standing by my locker when suddenly my best friend Layla appeared and gripped my shoulders. Oh my god, have you heard the news? Everybody is saying Willow only got into top set because her parents made a huge donation to the school. Can you believe that? What? Who's spreading this absurd rumor? I don't know, but someone's saying that she wasn't that smart in middle school. Oh. My. God. Was the rumor culprit me? It was me! I did it! At the expedition! Oh no, I, I didn't mean to! Oh, how could I let this happen? Then when I entered class, I noticed a sobbing willow being comforted by some other students. I felt horrible, so I also went over to her and tried to cheer her up. Don't worry about it, willow. Everyone knows this rumor is a lie. Why would anyone do such a thing? I mean, I just transferred here. Who would hate me so much to say something so mean? Oh man, I sure felt guilty. Oh, could things get any worse? Um, yeah, turns out they can. As after class, Miss Holmes suddenly asked me and Willow to stay behind. Oh no, did she know I was the one who started the Willow rumor? I sat there sweating like a turkey at Thanksgiving, waiting for Miss Holmes to bust me. But then to my surprise, she said, Matt, please, can you help me get to the bottom of this horrible rumor? Phew, what a relief. But at the same time, I was freaking out. How was I supposed to catch the person responsible when I was the one who started the rumor? Albeit accidentally. Ugh, oh, what a dilemma. Wait a minute. I think I have an idea. What about I blame it on a troublemaker? It's not like they would care anyway. Whilst I'm a straight-A student, and getting into trouble for this could affect my chances to get into a prestigious college and ruin my life. Right at that moment, this guy called Bob shoved past us, then leaned against the wall and scrolled through his phone. Bingo. Gotcha. I put one hand against the wall and gave him a suspicious look. Hey, Bob. How you doing? Um, fine. So, about this Willow rumor? Who did you hear it from? Bob just shrugged and continued staring at his phone. Or did you do it? Maybe you were bored. So you spread the rumor to tease the new girl. Am I right? Or what? Only by then, Bob looked at me. What? Are you crazy? I don't know this Willow girl. Besides, I was off all last week sick. Now leave me alone. Oh man, this was a massive fail. Now what should I do? I needed a minute to think. Okay, don't panic, Nat. You're smart, so you'll think of something. That's when I turned and caught a glimpse of Willow's sad face. Don't worry, I will find out who did it. I comforted her. But inside I was screaming. I hated lying to her, but this was an accident. I never meant to spread that rumor. At that moment, Layla appeared and said she wanted to help. Great! Like this quest wasn't complicated enough. Ugh. Layla told us that she heard the rumor from this nerd, Ben. So we all tracked him down and asked him. But he heard it from some other dude, and it went on and on until a girl said that she heard it from Ashley. That's when I remembered that Ashley was on the talking group in the expedition. Oh no. I had to stop this encounter between us. So when they spotted Ashley, I started making weird noises and made out I had a stomachache. They were still going to her, so I had to scream loudly like I was in labor. 
In the medical room, I continued screaming as if I was in a lot of pain. The nurses diagnosed that it might be appendix pain, so I immediately needed to be transferred to the hospital. I instantly stopped screaming as soon as I heard that and said, it's just that time of the month. Phew, that was close. But at least I've successfully stopped them from investigating Ashley. Well, I spoke too soon, because right that second, Ashley walked into the medical room, but thank God she didn't mention me. Instead, she said Carl told her about it. Phew. To my luck, Carl was absent today, so the manhunt had to end here. It would unfortunately continue tomorrow, though. As we warily walked out of school, I glanced over at Willow and saw that she looked really down. Ugh, that made me feel so bad. So to make it up for her, I asked her if she wanted to grab a sandwich. My treat, of course. And she said yes. Mmm, that sandwich was so good. And Willow seemed to enjoy hers, too. It was great to see her happier, so I decided to extend our trip by going to the mall. Willow kept on glancing at this dress, but it was out of her price range, so being the awesome friend that I am, I bought it for her as a gift. Well, that's the least I can do after everything I'd done to her, right? But then I noticed something weird. When I was standing at the counter to pay for it, I turned around and saw her smirking. Then when she saw me looking at her, she immediately smiled and thanked me for the dress. Huh, so strange. The next day, the rumor scavenger hunt continued. Ugh. We cornered Carl and questioned him, but he couldn't remember where he heard it from. Layla asked him to think carefully, and he just shrugged and said he had no idea. Layla got suspicious, so she immediately reported him to the principal's office. I didn't even have a chance to stop her. The next thing I knew, we were being called out over the loudspeaker and summoned to go to the principal's office. Then Carl confessed that yesterday he got an anonymous message via Facebook saying that they were willing to pay him if he agreed not to tell the name of the person who told him the rumor. He showed us his phone, but all the messages and the user account didn't exist anymore. That's right. I was the anonymous user who contacted Carl yesterday. Thank God I deleted the messages and the account on time. But things weren't that simple. The principal decided to suspend Carl for withholding information. Finally! My plan worked! But why wasn't I feeling happy about it? On the contrary, I felt... Bad. Really, really bad. Blaming someone for my mistake wasn't right. I couldn't do that to Carl. So I stood up and blurted out, It was me all along. I started the rumor, but it was an accident. Well, and that's it. Cue a two-week suspension. Now Willow is refusing to hear my apology, and everyone else thinks I'm some villain. Only Layla has stuck by my side and remained adamant there was more to the story. Then, a few days later, when I was trying to curb my boredom with potato chips and a Love is Blind marathon, Layla came by and told me the shocking news. There may be a chance that I wasn't the person who spread the rumor about Willow. The thing is, Layla continued asking around school and ended up with a girl named Rosa, who had a reputation for gossiping. Rosa told Layla that she was in the bathroom when suddenly a girl in the cabin next to her started telling her about the rumor. Rosa found it odd, so she bent down to see who it was, but the only thing she could see was a pair of pink Nike Air Force One. Then Layla asked me, You know who always wears those, right? I nodded. But, objectively, there could be other girls who own the same shoes, correct? Fortunately, Rosa also noticed an important detail that will help us close the case. The right shoe has a tear mark. I checked our suspect's shoes, and they match. <gasps> so we finally knew who really did it. We just needed a plan to trap them. The next day, we called Willow to meet us at a cafe and told her that we found the real culprit. But when Willow arrived, she immediately got mad and yelled at me. Stop blaming it on somebody else. Maybe the person heard you when you were speaking about me during the expedition trip. As soon as Willow said that, Layla and I immediately looked at each other and grinned. What's so funny? I never told you that I spread the rumor at the expedition. I didn't even tell the principal. I only confessed that I was the one who said it. That's all. Willow looked shocked. Then we told her about Rosa and how she saw Willow's shoes, so Willow couldn't deny it anymore. Okay, it was me. I've never liked you, and you think you're so perfect. So at the expedition, when I overheard you talking about me like that, it made me so mad that I came up with the idea to spread the rumor about myself and then blame it on you. So you'd look like a horrible person and I'd get people's sympathy. A genius plan, right? Oh my, oh my. Who would have thought that the victim herself was actually the one who did the crime? Layla got so mad that she immediately wanted to report Willow to the principal, but I stopped her. I realized that it was partly my fault too. If I hadn't told people anything about Willow, then this never would have happened. So, well, after that, Willow and I stopped talking to each other, 
Actually, if I see her in the hallway, I'll purposefully walk the other way. But anyway, thanks to this incident, I learned some valuable lessons. Never, ever gossip, as it's just not worth it. And also, choose your friends wisely. Hi, I'm Viola, and today is a big day. You see, it's my first time ever acting in this awesome short film, but I can't seem to focus at all. Why, you ask? Well, that's because I just discovered I'm not real. Or, to be exact, I only exist in my best friend's imagination. Sounds strange, doesn't it? Until yesterday, I always thought of myself as a completely normal human being. <sighs> Let me tell you how it all started. The first memory I have involves my best friend Harlow. I woke up feeling dazed and confused and saw this pretty girl smiling down at me. She told me that I'd be safe now and that her parents were going to look after me. Strangely, I couldn't remember anything before that day, and no one told me what had happened. I could only guess that I'd probably been abandoned or something, and that Harlow and her parents were my saviors. So, from then on, I lived with Harlow's family, who showed me kindness and love. When I first got out of the hospital, I couldn't do anything by myself. From personal things like brushing my teeth and washing my face, to chores such as doing laundry and dumping the trash. At the time, it was Harlow who guided and helped me, like a caring big sister. Then, when we entered middle school and the boys started flirting with me, Harlow was always by my side to protect me. She told me how they would never like a plain, boring girl like me, and that they were only doing this to get close to her, as she was very beautiful. If I had a decision to make, big or small, I always consulted Harlow first, as I knew she'd know best. But recently... I noticed that Harlow was acting short-tempered with me. When I got a better grade on my English essay than her, she told me I only got that mark as the teacher just felt sorry for me. Then she stormed off. Man, I didn't mean to upset her, and it was really unfair that the teacher didn't give her the grade she deserved, as she's far smarter than I am. Then last week, this boy called Hank in our school's film club held open auditions for his short film project. Harlow was desperate to be in it, so I decided to go along with her for support. I thought Harlow's audition was marvelous, but for some reason, she wasn't picked. I was about to leave too, but then Hank asked me if I wanted to audition. So I did, and you know what? I got the lead role. I was so surprised, and so was Harlow. She insisted that they were just tricking me, and I shouldn't take the part, as why would they choose a girl with ordinary looks like me to play the female lead? But still, I wanted to give it a try. Opportunities like this don't come twice, right? So I accepted the part. I know Harlow was worried that they were just teasing me, but Hank and his crew seemed nice. And maybe he finds my normal look suitable for the character, right? The morning before the shooting day, I asked Harlow to lend me her pretty white dress to wear to the shoot. Harlow looked annoyed as she said, You spilled coffee on that dress last time you borrowed it, remember? You didn't even bother taking care of it, and now the stain's still there. No way! I remember washing it before returning it to you. Well, then you remember it wrong. It's my dress, so I'm hardly going to forget what you did to it, am I? Then she left in a temper. Strange. I remember using vinegar to clean the coffee stains, as it took me ages to scrub it off. But it is true that my memory isn't all that good. When I was a child, I once waited in the park in the rain for over an hour just because I thought Harlow told me to meet her there on Saturday afternoon. I said Sunday afternoon. I have piano practice today, silly. So maybe I misremembered again and really didn't wash the dress for her? That day in math class, Harlow got caught texting, so the teacher confiscated her phone. At break time, she asked me to sneak into the school administrator's room to get her phone back. But of course I refused as I was far too scared to do that kind of stuff. It's okay, no one can see you. Basically because you only exist in my imagination. What was she talking about? What did she mean by that? For the rest of the lesson, I kept thinking about Harlow's words. When the bell rang, seeing that I was still confused, Harlow pointed to a group of students standing nearby and told me that no matter what I did, they wouldn't see me. And that's true! 
When I waved my hands and talked to them, no one looked in my direction. I even snapped my fingers in front of them, but they didn't react at all. What is going on? Harlow told me that because she imagined me, she is in control of who sees me or not. Then she told me that if I still didn't believe it, I should go to the school administrator's room to get her phone. Then I'd see that she was telling the truth. The superintendent was standing right across the hallway, but Harlow assured me I'd be invisible to her. My heart was thudding like crazy, but I tried to shake back my nerves and continued to get her phone undetected. Whoa, the superintendent didn't see me at all! So what Harlow said was true? I only existed in her imagination? That means Harlow's really the one who decides what will happen to me. And who I'll meet? So basically the author of my life story. But does that also mean that I have no control over my own life? Well, if I even have a life. Then Harlow barged into my room and said, You've never wondered why you don't remember anything about your parents and about the time before you met me, have you? It was because I lost my memory after the accident. There was no accident, Viola. You have no previous memories because that was when I created you, as I wanted a friend to play with. I kept this truth a secret because I love you, and you always listen to me. But you've been so headstrong lately. After Harlow left, I found myself feeling so down. It turned out my whole life had never belonged to me. No wonder I was so plain and ordinary. All I am is a side character in Harlow's story. After a horrible, sleepless night, I didn't even feel like going to the film set anymore. And it's already late anyway. I was laying in bed, spacing out, when Hank phoned me asking where I was. I only exist in Harlow's imagination, so there's no point filming. Huh? What nonsense are you going on about? Stop joking, Viola. We're short on time over here. Seeing that I didn't even bother to reply to him, but just let out a long sigh, he continued. All right then, if that's the case, then you should at least make it count. Would you like to imagine yourself as just a boring nobody or a brilliant actress? I suppose Hank's words made sense, so I got myself back together and hurried to the film set. Even if I'm imaginary, I'll make this unreal life of mine unimaginably awesome. The filming was actually a lot of fun, and everyone complimented my acting. Hmm, they were probably just being nice, but it still felt good. Then Hank came over and congratulated me. Now that filming's over, you can be honest with me. I don't mind. I know you only cast me as the lead as you like Harlow. What do you mean? And the thing you said this morning as well about only existing in Harlow's imagination? I ended up blurting out everything to him, and you know what he did? He laughed. But when he saw that I was struggling to fight back my tears, he took my hand. Viola, listen to me. Harlow's tricking you. The only thing not real in all of this are her words, not you. No way. Harlow's my best friend. She would never do such a thing. If you only existed in Harlow's imagination, how come you still decided, on your own, to show up at film set this morning? How come you still meet other people without her being around? Like, right now? Harlow couldn't have written the script with all these little details, right? Come on, Vi. Think about it. But there was a time when Harlow made me invisible to everybody else. I snapped my fingers in front of them, and they didn't react at all. Hank asked me who these people were, and I told him. He said he'd make sure I saw sense. Then he left. This was so confusing. I cannot tell what is real and what's not anymore. The next day at school, when I was sorting my locker out, Hank dragged a reluctant-looking boy over to me. I recognized him. He was part of the group who didn't see me. Go on. Tell her everything. The boy told me how Harlow had bribed them to trick me. He also said that they distracted the superintendent so I could sneak into her office without being caught. What? I didn't understand why Harlow would do this to me. Hank went with me to confront her, and she faked a smile and said, Silly Viola, it was just a joke. So what about the fact that I can't remember anything about the time before I met you? You said there was no accident. It's also a lie, isn't it? I never said that. 
probably you misremembered again like so many times before. I view you as a sister, Viola. I'd never lie to you. I didn't know what to believe anymore. I needed to be alone for a minute. This was all too much to process. So I ran to the nearby park to clear my mind. Suddenly, I felt something cold next to my cheek. It was Hank. He passed me some water and told me to drink it and calm down. Viola, I think Harlow's gaslighting you. She's basically emotionally abusing you to make you question your own sanity. I know you see her as a sister, but she's really toxic. Could it? Could it be possible that Harlow didn't have my best interests at heart? But what did she even get out of this, though? I'm not sure if this was because she wanted me to rely on her or she's jealous, but either way, knowing she could deceive me like that hurt like crazy. I didn't want to believe that that was what had been happening, but after all explanations, it's so clear now that Harlow was gaslighting me. And ever since then, I tried to avoid her as much as possible. But this was tricky, seeing as we were in the same class and lived together. I just wished I could grow up fast, so I could go to college and leave this house. At least there was good news. Hank's film in which I starred had gained attention on YouTube, and he was even selected to attend the short film festival with a view to supporting the city's young, talented filmmakers. Then, one day, I arrived home from school to see Harlow's parents drinking coffee with a strange woman. Huh? She sure looked a lot like me. Suddenly, she was running over to me and hugging me in her arms. Oh, darling, you have no idea how long I've been waiting for this moment. Following a whole lot of confusion, Shocking revelations and emotions, I finally found out the actual truth. It turned out that when I was seven years old, Mom took me on a yacht trip. Only, there was a terrible accident, so we took the lifeboat to shore. But then Mom fell out and ended up being rescued by another boat. We both suffered memory loss. In fact, Mom only remembered who I was when she saw the short film I starred in on YouTube. And then she tracked me down here. After that, I returned to live with my real mom. And guess what? I now realize just how awesome I am. I'm grateful to Harlow's parents for looking after me, but I still haven't forgiven Harlow yet. I'm trying to, as I know she's not all bad, but it's going to take some time. I also feel so blessed to have Hank by my side to help me discover my confidence and value my own worth. He even says I can be in his next film project, which I'm really excited about. It's good to know that I'm actually real, and I exist outside of Harlow's mind. The world is mine for the taking. And who knows, maybe one day I'll end up being a professional actress. This view of the Alps is magnificent. Wow, I've never felt this free before. <sighs> huh? Hang on, are those meowing sounds that I'm hearing? I followed the sounds to the raging river nearby, and there, stuck on a rock in the middle of it, was a terrified cat. Oh no, poor baby, I've gotta help it. I quickly grabbed onto the nearby tree, then leaned out towards the rock with an opened umbrella on the other hand for the cat to jump onto. The cat hesitated for a bit before making the lead, but it's heavier than I expected. I lost my balance and tumbled into the river. I grabbed the cat just in time, but the strong current made it impossible to float. In a panic, I screamed for help, but the waves lapped over me and gulps of water filled my mouth. And just like that, I felt my surroundings darken. Ugh, what was this wet, scratchy thing rubbing on my face? I opened my eyes to see that cat sitting on me Thank goodness it was okay, but where am I? This seemed like some kind of rustic cottage house. Suddenly, a man walked into the room with a food tray. H who are you? Relax, I'm the one who jumped into the river to rescue you both. Turns out he happened to pass by the river while we were swallowed by the current, and he didn't hesitate to jump in to save us, then brought us back to his home. Oh, um, thank you for everything. Sure. Here, eat up. So, how come you and Topaz fell into the waterway? Who? Oh, you mean the cat? How come you know his name? It says it right here. See? 
I'm guessing this is not your cat then? I told him how I accidentally found Topaz, so its family must live around here somewhere. Hearing this, he agreed to help me find Topaz's owner the next day. He even gave me his bed for the night, then walked out saying he'd sleep on the couch. But as a guest, I couldn't let him do that, so I just grabbed the blanket and went to sit next to him. You have a cool tattoo there. Kinda looks like a mini Mars, right? Nah, it's my birthmark. The only thing my parents left me. Hans then told me that he grew up not having a clue who his parents were or why they abandoned him. At 18, he moved out of his foster home and came here to become an herbalist. <sighs> I felt so bad for him, and in a way, I could relate. Being alone is difficult, but having both mom and dad won't guarantee your happiness. I was born into a well-off family with both of my parents, but the thing was, they only got together due to an arranged marriage, and they have resented each other ever since. My house always felt so cold and empty, and I hated staying there. So, as soon as I graduated high school, I took a gap year to travel the world. Actually, Switzerland is my first stop. Gotta say, it's nice to have someone to talk to like this. I guess Hans felt the same way by this look he gave me. He seemed very touched. The next morning, we took Topaz to the town to ask around. Turned out, today was their annual festival, so a horde of people crammed along the street to celebrate and watch the parade. Hans held my hand so I didn't get lost, but somehow the crowd still pulled me away and I ended up stuck among these sweaty people. Suddenly, a hand grabbed mine and led me out of there. Whew, thank God, I couldn't breathe in there. And you know what? A super handsome, stylish guy was standing in front of me. Are you okay? That's when I noticed the tail of my shirt was ripped. Freaked out, I tried to cover it up, so he took out a silk scarf and tied it around my waist. For a second there, I froze to the spot, so amazed by his thoughtfulness. Just at that moment, my phone buzzed with a call from Hans. He told me to meet him at the fountain. Um, slight problem? I had no idea where that was. Well, lucky me. This gallant guy offered to take me there. We talked along the way, and I found out his name's Willard. He lives in a nearby town and was here for the festival. I told him I came to find the owner of the lost cat I'd found. Then, when I showed him the picture of Topaz, he couldn't hide his shock. Are you sure this is the cat you found? I nodded. He stayed silent for a while, then said, I might know its owner, but I gotta go now. Bring the cat to meet me there. Faye, it was nice meeting you. Then he bowed down to kiss the back of my hand before he left. How sweet. I watched as he disappeared into the crowd. Thanks to Topaz, I got the chance to meet him again. Uh, why are you making that funny face? I told him about my encounter with Willard and convinced him to come with me to the address on the handkerchief. He seemed skeptical at <sighs> first, but then gave in. I mean, other than this, we had no clue. It was worth a shot, right? The next day, we went to the place Willard told us, but seriously, is this right? Why were there a line of people all holding near on identical cats to Topaz? They even had the same collar as him. What is going on? I walked over to ask an old man sitting on a bench. He told me the millionaire lady who lives here had lost her dearest cat, Topaz. People said his name was on the top of her inheritance list and she promised to greatly reward anyone who safely returned him, so these frauds were trying to deceive the owner by bringing some Topaz look-alike here. But Madame Primrose is no fool. Huh? Madame Primrose? The iconic designer and president of Wisteria Fashion Corp? That's right. Oh my god! I immediately dragged Hans to stand in the line. You see, my childhood dream was to become a fashion designer, and, of course, the one I admired the most was none other than Madame Primrose! Ah! One of the reasons I came to Switzerland was to find her and hopefully become her apprentice. And now look, what are the odds? Finally, it was our turn, but... I'm gonna have to stop you right there. All right, everyone, listen up. Madame Primrose won't accept any toe passes from now on, as she's tired of your deceit. So, disperse. What? We didn't just wait half a day here for nothing. Fine, I'll find another way to get in. We then walked around the mansion and found its side gate. Then, just when we were climbing over it, a maid caught us. But she didn't make a fuss out of it. Instead, she seemed a bit flirty towards Hans. Ooh, I had an idea. There's our chance. You go and charm her. 
He seemed confused at first, but then got the point. Hey, I think you're really cute. Hans then <laughs> tried his best at flirting, and as soon as she swooned, I asked her to help us return Topaz to his owner. The maid hesitated at first, but when we said that we didn't need to be repaid or anything, she agreed to let us in. We quickly split up to find Madame Primrose. I wandered the maze-like hallways, then I suddenly bumped into someone. Mind your way! Wait, I don't know you. What are you doing here? I, uh, um... She's my new friend. Is there a problem? I'm sorry, young master. It was Willard. He came to rescue me again. Great to see you again, young master Willard. You live here? Why didn't you call me when you arrived? Did you bring the cat? Where is it? Give it to me right now. Willard, calm down. Topaz is safe. I just found out his owner is Madame Primrose and- I'm her grandson. Just give the cat to me now. His agitated behavior didn't seem right. I took a few steps back from him, refused to do what he said, then ran. You don't understand. Just at that moment, Hans and Madame Primrose appeared. There you are. Are you okay? He worriedly asked. But boy, all I could see right now was Madame Primrose. She approached me, held my hand, and repeatedly thanked me for risking my life to rescue Topaz. This was amazing, but... Hmm, but why did Willard just leave without saying anything? Madame Primrose invited us to stay for dinner that evening. Joining us were Willard and his mom, Agneta. Madame then told me how much Topaz meant to her. Twenty years ago, she lost her son, Mr. Alvarez, to a car accident. Then a year later, her grandson Leroy disappeared. Her grief was almost unbearable, but then she was gifted a cat, Topaz, and thanks to him, she began to heal. I tried comforting her by saying she still had Willard, her other amazing grandson with an excellent fashion sense inherited from his grandma. But to my surprise, Madame Primrose said Willard isn't her real grandson since Agneta is actually Mr. Alvarez's second wife and was a stepmom to the missing grandson, Leroy and Willard was her son with her ex-husband. I could see Willard and his mom were feeling so uncomfortable. Willard must have felt so hurt as Madame Primrose never even thought of him as a family member. Then my train of thought was interrupted by Hans. Ugh, why didn't he just tell me to pass him the salt instead of sticking his right arm to my face like this? Suddenly, Agneta gave him a mortified look and spilled wine all over the table. Mom, are you okay? She didn't reply, but just left. I could tell it was because she saw Hans's birthmark. What could this be? Has she no manners? She must be unwell. I'll go check on her. So I followed her to the garden gazebo. That's where I heard her talking to someone on the phone. You had one simple job. Take that pampered moggy miles away. Well, guess what? It came back. I gasped in shock, and right then, a hand covered my mouth. Shh. Be quiet. Oh, but it gets worse. The stupid cat brought Leroy, the missing grandson, home. That's right. I saw that Mars birthmark with my own eyes. If Primrose finds out about this, we're done. You hear me? Wait, so Leroy, Madame Primrose's only grandchild, is actually Hans. Uh, and his stepmom was the one who secretly gave him away in the first place. Even worse, I was hearing the shocking news with her son. Willard, get it together. Do you know anything about her plan? I knew Mom was behind Topaz going missing. That's why I tried to take the cat away earlier, to keep him safe from her. But... but Leroy too? That was just heartless. What should I do now? She's my mom, after all. I could see his pure and kind soul being tormented, and my heart <clears throat> ached for him. I know it must be hard, but you need to tell Madame Primrose the truth and make things right. That's a way to help your mom redeem herself, okay? He stared at me with those dreamy eyes of his, and I felt my heart turn to mush. But a phone call from Hans interrupted us. He was looking for me, saying we gotta go. Right, I had to tell him the truth. In a cab back to Hans's cottage, I told him everything, and he just burst out laughing, saying, <laughs> I'm Leroy, the heir of a millionaire. Oh, please. <laughs> I'm serious. You were brought to the foster home exactly 19 years ago, and you both have this one-of-a-kind birthmark. Okay, so what if I'm really her grandson? I don't even know her, and I'm definitely not rich kid material. You've been lonely your entire life. This is your chance to find the family you've always wanted. Hans was speechless. It seemed I'd hit his weak spot. 
and he finally agreed. We asked the driver to take us back to the mansion. But no one was awake at that hour except a gardener. He led us to a library deep into the mansion, brought out tea, and told us to wait. Just a few minutes later, Hans started coughing, and his face swelled up. Oh no, he must have been allergic to something in the tea. Panicked, I screamed for help, and the gardener came back and carried Hans to the car. But then, a hand muzzled me from behind, and everything went dark. I woke up with my head pounding and unable to move. As I tried to make sense of the situation, I realized I was tied to a chair, mouth taped, surrounded by some rusty, unsanitary medical tools. And on the other side of the room, Hans was unconscious and tied to a patient's bed. Standing next to him was Agneta and the gardener and a guy in a blouse with some kinds of tools in his hand <laughs> about to do something to Hans's birthmark. I tried to scream and struggled to break free, but I couldn't move an inch. Right at that moment, Willard barged in. Stop this. Leave right now, or I'll call the cops for your unlicensed business. And Mom, I already know everything, so please have some remorse. Agneta looked so ashamed of herself. Willard, everything I did, I did it for you. Please understand. You saw how that old hag Primrose treated me. I was so miserable. Then your dad offered to help me. Dad? You mean Tim? How can he be my dad? Don't be such a wimp, son. I've stayed and worked here like a servant just to be close to you. We did all this so you can be the only heir. You deserve that. Now, finish it. I... I can't, Tim. Get away from my mom, you dirtbag. You never cared about me. You only moved here to manipulate her to do your dirty work. A terrible person like you will never be my dad. Then I'll do it. As he was about to lay hands on Hans, suddenly there was a meowing sound and Topaz appeared, followed by Madame Primrose. Step away from my grandson. You dared to live under my roof all this time and play foul tricks on my family? Take him away. Luckily, Hans came round and he had a tearful reunion with his grandma. They finally had the closure they deserved. Hans decided to stay in the mansion with his long lost family. He's even planted an herbal garden there for treating and healing people, as he always wished. Madame Primrose had finally found peace, as now she had both her beloved grandson and precious cat back. She also thought that maybe she'd been too strict on Agneta, so she decided not to press any charges against her. Agneta had also apologized, but she felt too full of shame to stay and decided to move out of the mansion. Willard followed his mom and helped her start a new life. What about me? Well, I got the thing I've always dreamt of, to be Madame Primrose's apprentice. That's her gift to me for bringing both her cat and her grandson back. And right now, I'm late for a date with a very special guy. Can you guess who it is? This school is so boring. All they do is talk nonsense and do nonsense things. Worse still, I feel like I can never escape them, as some of them live in the same neighborhood as me. But you know what the most annoying thing about my life is? That's Joy, my identical twin sister. In my parents' eyes, she's perfect. That's why she's the favorite child. Her allowance is more than mine, and she gets to attend an elite private school while I'm stuck at the most boring school ever. How unfair! With a sulky face, I walked into my room whining. I think having identical daughters means our parents forgot that there's actually two of us. They've never picked me up from school. Don't be absurd. They just took me to collect my dress for the school gala. <laughs> a new dress for some fancy party. How terrible for you. I don't even want to go to the party. Trust a nerd like you not to appreciate what you have. If I were you, I'd make the most of every second of that elite school of yours. And if I were you, I would just enjoy my pressure-free life. We both sighed and stared into a void, thinking about our tiring lives. Then Joy suddenly turned to me. Oh my god, Jade! Do you want to be me? Go to my school, have my things, and attend the gala? What a brilliant idea! Why had we never thought of it before? I'd live her fancy life and she'd live my dull one. That's perfect! Wow, this school is enormous. I tried to keep my cool as I navigated the endless hallways in search of Joy's locker. Ah, found it. I spotted a group of girls waving me over. They must be Joy's besties, Ruth, Nora, and Nell. 
Unlike my boring sister, they looked very glam in their branded clothes. What a power group. Wherever we went, all eyes were on us. Students handed us snacks, saved places in the cafeteria line for us, and let us sit in the front row of the basketball match. These girls were so interesting that I fit in with them way more than Joy did. Talking about Joy, she somehow loved my boring old-fashioned school. I'd never heard her chat that much in my life about how nice my friends were, how easy all the lessons were, and how cool the school bus was. Joy's friends were so much fun, and they did cool things. For instance, they always had shopping dates and bought each other expensive gifts without question. One time, Nora, the richest girl in the group, didn't hesitate in going into Kate Spade and buying the new release hand ad for Ruth. I thought this was pretty awesome of Nora, but then something happened that made me question the group dynamics. Ruth told me that she liked the red velvet cupcakes at the bakery near my house, and she asked me to buy her some. I was happy to do it, but the next day, when I brought the cupcakes and told her the price, she burst out laughing. <laughs> Joy, my dear, I don't care how much they cost. That's your concern. Then she turned to Nora, showed her a picture of a cute but expensive skirt, and told her to order it for her. Hang on, had she always been thinking it was acceptable to order us around like this? I don't understand why an innocent bookworm like my sister would hang around with this cunning clique. They don't study at all. During the test, while I was still randomly circling the answer, Ruth kept on kicking my chair and urging me to let her copy my work. And as soon as the teacher turned her back on us, she even snatched my answer sheet. Huh? What's with that attitude? I took a look around and saw both Nora and Nell were also copying another girl's paper against her will. Rude! After the test, Ruth came up to me, hissing. Have you forgotten our deal? Huh? Deal? What could it be? Well, I guess I would have to put up with Ruth for as long as I was Joy, so I could return everything to her in roughly the same condition after the gala. What I really should do now is just to enjoy this elite school life, right? So, I didn't join Ruth and her minions for lunch, but bought food from this super cool vending machine instead. They even had pizza! But, the machine made these weird sounds. Ugh, I think my food was stuck. So I kicked and tapped it. But it still didn't work. <laughs> you dare get into an altercation with the pizza machine? You must be starving. Oh my god, this basketball boy was the most handsome guy I'd ever seen in my life. I was too lost in his eyes to realize the dumb machine had finally delivered my lunch. This gorgeous guy then leaned towards me and my heart skipped. Oh Cupid, I wish I was the one he picked up instead of the pizza. Here you go. Right before I could react, someone snatched the tray and pushed me aside to enter between us. Thanks Hayden, wanna share lunch with me? Huh, excuse me? How could she steal both pizza and a boy from me? The boy took my pizza from her and said, Thanks, but I'd like to share this with this cute starving girl instead. I'll buy the drinks. Wait, was he asking me? Then yes, 100% yes! Leaving a furious Ruth behind us, we walked to the bench table nearby. So, he's Hayden, the captain of the basketball team. We talked so much about our favorite comic books and even played basketball for a bit before classes. That was my best lunch ever! After school, I was about to leave when Ruth stopped me. Didn't anyone ever tell you not to mingle with Hayden? He's not wealthy. We have high standards about who deserves to be around us. Duh! Huh? She sure seemed to swoon over him earlier, but now that he'd turned her down, she decided he wasn't worthy? This girl's mindset really didn't sit well with me. As soon as I arrived home, I told Joy everything. You should listen to Ruth. Hayden must be bad news. I don't care what Ruth thinks. How come you do? Is it because of this deal you have with her? <sighs> Not your business, but stay away from Hayden. I don't want to get in trouble. Ugh, this vague hints were agitating me. What was it about? But whatever the deal between Joy and Ruth was, I wasn't going to let it get in the way of my blossoming romance with Hayden. Today, me and Hayden had arranged to meet at lunch again to play basketball. I excitedly walked out of art class just as the girl fell and dropped her painting set around my feet. I immediately picked them up for her, when all of a sudden, a boy's hand covered mine right before someone stamped their feet on our hands. 
It was Ruth. It was her who tripped up the poor girl, too. She did all that on purpose to hurt me. But Hayden got there just in time to save the day. What do you think you're doing? Feeling too embarrassed being caught red-handed, Ruth couldn't do anything but give me a spiteful look before leaving. I couldn't believe that Hayden did that for me. His hand was swollen, but he just kept checking if my hand was okay. How can Ruth be so horrible? Because she knows everyone's ugly secrets, and she uses them to control people. Joy, she knows your secret too, right? No. Uh, um... I'm not sure, but I don't care. No matter what that secret is, she's gone too far. Don't worry, I got your back. So will I. Oh, I'm Katie, by the way. From then on, I no longer hung out with Ruth and her minions, but I kept quiet about this to Joy as I didn't want her freaking out and making us switch back places early. The more time I spent with Hayden, the more I found myself liking him. I wanted to confess to him who I really am, but I can't. At least not yet anyway. <sighs> Katie is really nice to me too, and she introduced me to her super sweet friends. Everything was just perfect, except my grades. Well, I didn't dare to tell Joy about this either. My study was pretty bad, and it literally ruined Joy's straight A record. Meanwhile, Ruth, time after time, insisted that I was the one who had to do all her homework, research, and tests. But duh, I couldn't even finish mine. You know what I've got. Yeah? What exactly is that you have? What's all the threat about? Ruth was stunned seeing me talking back at her like that. Yep, that was it. I've had enough. After class, she waited at my locker and signaled me to follow her to the equipment room. Finally, I could know what my secret was. Ruth showed me a video on her phone of Joy sneakily checking her notes during an examination. Was she cheating? If our principal sees this, I'm sure your precious scholarship will be long gone. And what about that excellent student title of yours? So Ruth was using this to manipulate Joy. Does she do the same to everyone else? Do you think this would scare me? I don't think. I know. You don't want to lose everything, right? <laughs> no, Ruth. It's you who's gonna lose. Do whatever you want with that clip. Like, I care. And so, I walked away, leaving a fuming Ruth behind. To be honest, I was a bit scared. Well, I know scores and things like academic transcripts were so important to Joy. What if I destroyed it all? After my last class of the day, the thing that I feared the most came upon me. The principal called me to her office and showed me the video that proved that I cheated on a math exam. She was so disappointed in my horrible grades recently, she even asked if it was because I was too caught up in my dating life and the bad influence I called friends. But how am I supposed to tell her that it was just my own incompetence? Nothing to do with Joy or Hayden or my new friends. I just reached my room door when I heard mom scolding Joy. The principal must have called her. It was all my fault. When mom left the room, I could feel how angry and frustrated mom was. Joy, I'm so sorry. I couldn't let Ruth have this hold over me. Um, I mean you anymore. I waited for Joy to take it out on me. But to my surprise, she was kinda happy. <gasps> That's okay. I think I should thank you for that. I've never been brave enough to stand up for myself, although I was so tired of getting picked on all the time. I was so scared, but turns out being scolded by mom isn't as bad as I thought. <laughs> My homeroom teacher also called me, but she only gave me a warning and told me not to make the same mistake again. I've never felt this at ease before, Jade. I'm not the perfect Joy anymore. Then, Joy told me about the pressure she felt to be perfect. One time, she even got sick before the math test due to studying too much. Not having enough decent revision and being afraid of getting a bad grade, Joy cheated and was caught and recorded by Ruth as evidence. We finally understood each other and decided to teach Ruth a lesson to stop manipulating and taking advantage of others. We spied on Ruth and secretly recorded her. And guess what? Turned out she was not as wealthy as she always pretended to be. All the brand names she had were from the poor victims that she called friends. I also filmed Ruth forcing the top students to do homework and essays for the rich kids while she just sat idly to collect money. I was so ready to post these videos online, but Joy stopped me. She told me if we did this, we were just as bad as Ruth. Instead, she had a better idea. 
she sent the videos to Ruth and demanded her to delete all of the student's secrets. In exchange, we would delete all of hers. Ruth, of course, had no choice but to obey. Wow, how mature my sister is. My last day in Joy's life has arrived. I'm just gonna make the most of it before I hand the reins back to my sister. Honestly, I kinda miss my normal school and my friends. But what about Hayden? Will he still want to know me when he finds out I lied to him? I was looking around for Hayden when I saw some mean girls mocking Ruth for wearing a dress cheaper than theirs. So I walked straight up to them and whispered into their ears that I knew all their dirty secrets and they couldn't do anything else but storm off. Ruth gave me a coy look, mumbled a thank you, and then left. At that moment, a warm hand gently clasped mine. Hayden! Wow, you're so cool. I... I'm not that cool, Hayden. Actually, I am... Um, I have something I have to tell you. I then told him everything, from how I swapped identities with my twin sister, to how I ruined her school life because of my childishness. You didn't ruin anything. Actually, you made things much better. So, since the pizza vending machine day till now, it has always been you, not Joy, right? Yeah, it's been me all along. <laughs> That's all I needed to know. Then he pulled me in for the best kiss ever. I stood in front of this shabby cottage, trying to calm myself and went inside. One step in, and the door snapped shut. I freaked out and banged on the door. Let me out! Let me out! But only ghastly laughter resounded. Just then, I could feel someone coming close to me. I turned around and was terrified by what I saw. Hey, Clover here. The one that just got scared witless. I know, so embarrassing. Let me tell you how I got myself into that situation in the first place. But before I do, please like and subscribe. I used to have everything. I come from a family of esteemed cardiologists who's made numerous contributions to the medical field. And as the next generation of Howards, I took immense pride in continuing their legacy, which was getting a Harvard medical degree and becoming a doctor. That's why I always made sure my academic record was top notch. I went to this elite private school, aced every subject, and became the class president. Finally, winter dance prepping's finished, so I could sit back and watch this magical night come to life. Suddenly, my phone got a notice. It's an article about my parents and how they were involved in an operation that cost a patient's life. No way was this real. But when I looked up, everyone was giving me bombastic side eyes. Jeez, I should go to my parents now. I had to ask as soon as I found them. Mom, Dad, what the press is saying isn't true, right? Honey, listen. When the patient was brought in, there wasn't much we could do for her. It was too late. Turns out, she's from the Albert family, a very powerful family in the country. They didn't take it too well, especially her son. He blamed my parents for his mom's passing, meaning this media crisis was his doing. My parents explained to him many times, but to no avail. Now he even took legal actions against them. They had no choice but to show up in court. The incident quickly became talk of the town. Everyone was throwing jibes at us. Gosh, all these turmoils were driving me insane. Clover, can you solve this equation? Clover? Clover! Stop! The whole room turned silent for a second and stared at me like I was some freak. I picked up my books and stormed right out of class, but still, whispers followed me everywhere I went. There was no other place for me to be, so I just ran home and wept tears of frustration. My parents came in all worried for me. They thought maybe it's best if I stayed at my aunt's place. But mom, dad, I can't just leave you here. You're not leaving us. It's just that things are messy right now, and we don't want you to be affected. Besides, it's just temporary. Once the lawsuit's over, we'll reunite. Promise? Promise. When I arrived at my aunt's house, she seemed annoyed. Your room's in the attic. You're just here temporarily, so do not make any fuss. It's bad enough your parents got slapped with a lawsuit. Just then, I got a text. Mom's checking in on me. I shouldn't worry her, right? But honestly, I'm not sure how I'd survive this place. First day of school, I had to ride this pile of junk here. Cycling alone made me sweat like a dog. Just then, a boy passed by and yelled at me. Hey, you got a fat side! Excuse me? I said, you got a flat tire! Oh, that explains a lot. He helped me fix it. 
A few minutes later, the bike was good to go. The guy's Percy. He went to the same school as me, and today was also his first day. So, we arrived at school together. As soon as we entered the hallway, everyone stared at us. Suddenly, two girls came dragging me aside. Who are you? Why are you with Percy? You're not his girlfriend, right? Jeez, I met him ten minutes ago. I don't even know who he is. OMG, you live under a rock or something? He's Percy Albert, the sole heir of the powerful Albert family! That name… Could it be a coincidence? The son that insisted on suing my parents went to the same school as me? Hold on, Clover. This could be your chance to manipulate him into withdrawing the lawsuit. And boom! Things could go back the way they were. Hmm, let's see. I could make him fall for me. People would do anything for love, right? Lucky me, Percy and I were in the same biology class where we worked in pairs. The two girls from before, Holly and Jody, started fighting to be his lab partner. Meanwhile, he straight up asked me. Well, well. Not a finger lifted and the prey was already in my trap. That night, I went on his social media account and found out he often golfed at Rolling Greens. I could be a caddy. Just had to apply for the position. I got accepted in no time and quickly got used to the job. Oh, and I just happened to go through Percy's golfing schedule and totally did not plan this chance encounter. I parked the golf cart ready to seduce my Ken doll. But somehow, standing in front of me was Holly and Jody. What took you so long? Do you know how hot it gets? At least I still got a chance with him on the field. But as soon as these blondies caught sight of Percy, they flew towards him like moths to a flame. So I was left to carry these human-sized bags. Ew, she's stinking with sweat. Social distance, please. Stop, you're being mean. Clover, let me help you with that. Thanks. You came to my rescue again. No worries. Say, I didn't know you worked here. Yeah, I'm pretty good at golf. By the way, for your 50-yard shot, you might want to use this club. Center yourself and give it a good backswing. Percy took my advice and caught a strike. Already? Hey, how would you like to be my personal caddy? Hmm, I don't know. Come on, help a guy out. Okay, on one condition. When the time's right, I'll use this card. When exactly? I'm so intrigued right now. <laughs> you just wait. From then on, we always stick together golfing and hiding from Holly and Jody. Hey, are you free this Saturday? Since you helped me out and everything, I, um, want to repay you. Yes, my plan worked. I was so happy I could jump up and scream. But that only happened inside my head. I still gotta play it cool. Only if it's a date. Saturday came and we took a trolley downtown to watch the streets in the fall. Look at how pretty the golden leaves are. We then stopped at this carnival. And I gotta admit, Percy seemed genuinely sweet. He protected me from the rushing crowd, held my hand when I was petrified on the Ferris wheel. His caring gestures had my heart racing a bit, and also wondered, how could this guy resent my parents that much? As the last ray of sunlight disappeared, the carnival lit up, and Percy's eyes suddenly looked so dreamy. Snap out of it, Clover! You're supposed to make him fall for you, not the other way around! The ride ended and I immediately went to get some refreshments to calm myself down. But holy cow, I couldn't find my wallet anywhere! What do I do? Excuse me, I'll pay for her. How much is it? Thank you so much! I owe you big time. No worries. Please, at least give me your contact, I'll pay you back! Is that your way of asking me out? No, I… Well, if your boyfriend doesn't mind, give me your hand. Meet me at Caribou's Coffee Shop, 8am Sunday. Here, treat. After the date, I was sure Percy had feelings for me. I just needed to make him say it. Then I spotted Dumb and Dumber sneaking around my locker. They're trying to fake a note from Percy to me. Tell her to meet Percy at the haunted house in the woods. Then we'll trap her inside. Hmm, lame pranks. But I suppose I can go along with them and get Percy all worked up. Nice! And of course, gotta let Percy know where I was heading. I know this was a stupid prank, but the eerie vibe still gave me the creep. I stood in front of this shabby cottage, <sighs> trying to calm myself and went inside. One step in, and the door snapped shut. I freaked out, banged on the door. Let me out! Let me out! But no use! Only the sound of ghastly laughter resounded. Just then, I could sense someone coming closer to me. I turned around, so terrified, blood drained from my face. Oh my ghost! Stop shrieking, stupid child. I'm not a ghost yet. He, he's a real person? Clover, don't worry. It's just my grandpa. Grandpa? What's your grandpa doing here? Um, this is my house. 
So this used to be his granddad's house when he was young. Since Percy's mom passed away, grandpa's health deteriorated. No one in the family cared about him except Percy, as they were all deep in sorrow and hatred. Percy mourned for his mom too, but had to stay strong for his grandpa. So he brought him back to this peaceful house, hoping grandpa would feel better. At that moment, I felt bad for what happened to Percy and his family. Losing their loved one must have been so painful. I suddenly understood his motive now, and he badly needed this hug. Clover, I think I'm in love with you. I gushed over his words. Looking in his eyes, I knew it was real, and what I felt for him was also genuine. We could work this out, right? I'd tell him the truth and my side of the story. He'd understand. Percy, I love- But one phone call from mom changed everything. Honey, we lost the case. Their son has taken everything away from us. Our property, our legacy. Your dad was so distressed, he almost had a heart attack. Hearing mom's words, tears started streaming down my cheeks. What was I thinking? How could we possibly be together? After that, I avoided Percy completely. I also decided to move out of my aunt's and find a new place. And guess who hooked me up? It's Hunter, the guy I met at the carnival. We did end up going on a coffee date. He seemed cool and knew his way around town. So I asked if he knew a place that me and my parents could stay, as they'd move here soon. Look at this! Pretty cozy, huh? Hunter was nice enough to help me move. Just then, there's a knock on the door. I opened it to see Percy. He got so worried and went looking for me. But once he saw Hunter, he was dumbstruck. Didn't expect you'd find this place so fast, brother. Wait, you two are brothers? Sadly, yes. And we're supposed to mourn for our late mother. Yet here he is playing lovebirds with you. If losing mom isn't that big of a deal for him, let's see how he'd like losing you. Don't you dare touch her. Or what? You'll punch me? You Alberts are the worst. Was ruining my family not enough? What are you talking about? I'm Clover Howard. My parents were the doctors who tried to save your mom, but got punished for that. I was so stupid to think I could convince you to drop the lawsuit. My family's in shambles now. Happy? I, I didn't know. Get out. Never come near me again. Percy had to haul off with a regretful look. A few days later, my parents arrived. I told them everything that had happened, but they said the son who pressed charges was actually Hunter, not Percy. Turns out, their family situation was complicated. Hunter went missing when he was seven, and not until recently did he return, but then his mom unexpectedly passed away. He must have been so miserable that he had to take it out on us. Percy, on the other hand, was really thoughtful and understanding. He did all he could to stop his brother, and I just put it all on him. I had to go fix this. When I got to the cottage, Percy was trying to stop Hunter from messing with my family again. You don't get a say in this. You grew up with mom's love while I got nothing, and you couldn't even pay her proper respect. We can mourn her in different ways. Mom wouldn't want us to dive deep in hatred. <laughs> mom wouldn't want us to befriend people who couldn't save her. And you fell in love with their daughter? Traitor! Hunter was about to punch Percy. I had to stop him. Quick! Clover? You should leave now. No, I came here to apologize to you. We gotta work things out. Then let's have a little chit-chat, shall we? I was so close to having a taste of Hunter's fist when Percy came between us and took the full blow. We both ended up on the floor. And when we looked up, their grandpa was already there and witnessed everything. Percy, Hunter, stop fighting. His breath suddenly fell short. His knees were trembling. I immediately called my parents for help, but Hunter snatched my wrist. What are you doing? Call your parents here to mock us? No, I'm just trying to help. He then was on the phone with their family doctor, but she couldn't come because there was a storm blocking all roads. Please, can't you see Grandpa's in pain? You shut it. I'd never get help from those lousy doctors again. Hunter, I'm sorry for what happened. I really am. But don't let your hatred endanger your granddad. I could see Hunter's conflict, but with every second passed, their grandpa became pale. His breath got weaker. He needed to decide now. Please, save him. I immediately called my parents. Minutes later, they arrived and gave him first aid right away. Luckily, Grandpa reacted positively to the medication and gradually recovered. Hunter then broke down in tears. I can't believe I almost put Grandpa in danger just because of my blind hatred. And you didn't think twice about helping. I, I'm so, so sorry, everyone. Clover, Mr. and Mrs. Howard, I promise I'll make this right. 
The following day, Hunter arranged a press conference admitting he was wrong to bring my parents to court. Thus, he'd take full responsibility in fixing his mistakes, including clearing our reputation and compensating us financially. When it's settled, we started a new life here. My parents bought a house, founded this hospital to help people, while I got to continue my dream of becoming a doctor. Harvard meds, here I come! Oops, almost forgot. Of course, Percy and I got together. You didn't think we went through all that, and I never admitted my feelings, did you? I'd been holding it back for what felt like forever. Now, I get to have my happy ending. Hi, I'm Vicky, the only daughter of a billionaire. Also the sole heir from the third generation of an English aristocracy. Growing up, I was always referred to as Nepo Baby, but this is so unfair. If I had one sentence to sum up my entire life, it would be, well, that didn't go as planned. Before we start, please like and subscribe. I used to live the life of a princess. My house staff was on hand 24 hours to cater to all of my needs. And the biggest decision I had to make each day was to choose which car to go to school in. Still, I wasn't Regina George everyone wanted me to be. I was friendly to everyone and took both my education and my talent seriously. From an early age, I found a huge love for painting. You see, my daddy even invited global superstars over just so they could pose for me. Then, it struck me like a bolt of lightning when my daddy got involved in a messy lawsuit and ended up in jail. As a result, we had to kiss goodbye to everything. Yes, the mansion, the staff, but the worst blow was losing Brad, the butler's son who happened to be my boyfriend. My sweetie pie, I will collect the stars from the skies if it leads me back to you. Well, a girl gotta survive. So I did what I had to. I sold all of my beloved clothes and jewelry. But holy cow, all those Pradas, Gucci's, and Tiffany's still weren't enough to cover a week in a five-star hotel. Hey, use this. Miss, your card has been declined. Clearly you have insufficient funds and therefore must leave. Excuse me? The nerve, the ingratitude. I used to be one of their best customers. It wasn't as if I was the second inventing Anna or anything. So that's how I ended up here, under this bridge full of homeless people, desperately waiting for Brad to come back to me. In the meantime, at least I still had my paintings, which could be my ticket out of here, right? But Jesus, look! Those people kept taking them to smash cockroaches, while others even used them as firewood! Then, one day, as my belly was arguing with me over the lack of food, this charity group showed up. They came to distribute food to the homeless. I scrambled to my feet to ask for some, but was stopped by this woman. Look at your flashy outfit. You can't take food off the needy. How inappropriate. No, 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 I'm homeless too. Just then, a whiff of the Labo Santal 33 filled the air and a luxurious lady emerged from the crowd. She waved off the mean woman, then peered at my drawing. Did you paint these? Yes, I've been painting since I was a child. I've painted everyone from Taylor Swift to Ronaldo. Impressive indeed. I'm Diana, a widow of a great fortune. How would you like to come and live with me in exchange for sharing your artistic brilliance in my daily portrait? I was speechless for a few secs, then agreed right away. I was obviously destined to be rich, so it seems I couldn't escape my fate. I arrived at the villa, thinking that this was awesome and I'd finally landed back on my feet. But then, the euphoria was replaced with a gut-wrenching blow when Diana introduced me to her fiancé. Brad? Right after the awkward introduction, I pulled Brad away and confronted him. How could you cheat on me like this? I'll tell Diana. We broke up. Besides, having exes is normal. If you tell Diana I'm your ex, then it's you she'll throw out, not me. I couldn't believe the cheek of this guy. And you know what? We never broke up. I just couldn't spend another moment stuck with this jerk, so I decided to paint Diana a portrait as a thank you and then leave forever. Only, she really loved my painting. Thinking back to those glum days under the bridge, I realized, well, Brad was here, but so was a warm bed, steady meals, and someone who genuinely loved my art. This place was big enough to avoid him anyway, right? So far, so good. Well, until one day. All I did was ask the maid to get me a clean paintbrush when a guy got all grouchy with me. You have legs, do it yourself. Who are you to talk to me like that? Soon to be the owner of this mansion? Any problem? Leave her alone. It's what the staff are here for anyway. The room suddenly bristled with tension as Brad and that guy exchanged hostile looks. 
Then he coldly walked away. Suddenly, Brad pulled me out to a corner. Vicky, sorry for hiding it from you, but I have no feelings for Diana. I'm here to spy on her as she's the reason your father's in jail. I'm here to find evidence and help him regain his honor. Wow, what? I know, it's hard to believe, but I need to cooperate with me. That dude is Charles, Diana's son. He'll try to mess with me by all means, so we need to stop him before he does. It made sense now. I knew Brad loved me really and wouldn't pick some old woman over me. Then he told me his plan. He'd continue seducing Diana and persuade her to get me to tutor Charles, while I had to befriend Charles to get information out of him. I felt kind of nervous, but the chance to clear Daddy's name left me with no doubts. However, Charles wasn't the approachable type. He was so curt and rude. And no matter how wide I flashed my friendly smile, I always heard no more than six words from him. Let's do some still life painting today, shall we? You do what you want. I was trying my best to teach him, but he doodled on the page and always came up with the worst drawings I've ever seen. Then one day, he suddenly insisted we go outside for some outdoor portraits, and he to draw me. So my plan did work! Yes! I excitedly stood in the bay window and did an elegant pose. It was sweltering standing there, but I endured it for the art. But it had been four hours and he didn't seem to have finished. I couldn't stand any longer, so I rushed to him and dropped my jaw to see what his canvas was. Totally blank! I am furious! <sighs> Calm down, Vicky. Perhaps Charles was like an onion, with multiple layers waiting to be peeled away. So I decided to take a more psychological approach. I asked Diana for Charles' photo book and saw a family photo. This must be Charles' father. I'd paint it in the hope this thoughtful gesture would move him somehow. On Charles' birthday, I happily gave him the beautifully framed painting. Unexpectedly, upon seeing that, his face darkened and he had this fiery look in his eyes. He furiously threw the painting to the ground and yelled at me. Disappear! I can't stand you! What the? Fine then! Why is this guy gonna be so rude? I spent all week on that painting. What a psycho! I was packing my bags when Diana came into my room. She explained that the man in the photo wasn't Charles's father, but her ex-boyfriend. Charles's father died when he was little, then her ex was the one who had taken care of Charles since then. To Charles, he was the world. That kid was even closer to him than me. But then we broke up and he vanished without as much as a word. Charles has been hostile and distant ever since. I didn't know behind his rocky exterior was such a bitter truth, so I immediately found him. Charles, I I'm sorry. Go! I might look terrible now, but I was once my father's princess. He gave me everything I could ever ask for, except his time. My parents divorced early, and I was left alone. Just like you, Charles. This loneliness, this yearning for a family bond, I share with you. Seeing his hand loosen, I continued. My intention was never to belittle you. All I wanted was to burst the chasm of misunderstanding between us. Charles still stayed silent, but his facial muscles had relaxed. And when his gaze met mine, he slammed the door shut. So I decided to stay. And even though Charles continued being a grouch towards me, he stopped with the pranks. I also noticed that when Charles focused on something, he turned into a different person. He always stuck his tongue out, which looked adorable. Watching Charles drawing as if he was fighting with the paper, I came here and guided him. But suddenly, our eyes met. He has such dreamy eyes. Oh no, Vicky, less of that. You were here to prove my daddy's innocence and get back to the old life. As for me and Brad, we had to make do with grabbing moments together when we could. When this is over, we can vow to be together forever and have a wedding more lavish than any of the Kardashians. My love, you must be patient. We will be together properly soon. However, when everyone was around, Brad kept up the lovey-dovey pretense with Diana. I knew it was totally fake, but I couldn't help but feel annoyed. I couldn't just sit there smiling like everything was peachy. So, after I finished the painting, I followed Brad, intending to ask him what the next step was after I successfully approached Charles, when I spotted him sneakily talking to someone. Hey Pop, yeah, Diana's like putty in my hand. Vicky complicated things, but I came up with a plan to deceive her. I thought that little pest would be long gone by now, but seems Charles hasn't kicked her out. Any ideas? The fury whirled like a tornado inside me. I instantly charged at him and smacked him in the face. What? You? Wait till Diana finds out about this. Oh yeah? If you challenge me, then be prepared to lose. Say hi to your bridge pals for me. I immediately found Diana and exposed all about Brad to her. 
but her face suddenly turned serious. I knew you'd say anything to divert from the truth, but I know you stole money from me. The maid found it in your room. Stole? What? What are you talking about? Then I looked at Brad and saw him smirking. That conniving mastermind. Before I could try and defend myself, a staff member hurried in and passed Diana a letter. Charles was missing. Everyone was freaking out and refused to hear me out. And the chaos left me powerless as my stuff was dumped outside the villa. I ended up right back where I started and had a complete meltdown. Worst of all, I was worried about Charles. Was he home yet? The next morning, I was trying to sketch something when out of nowhere, Charles appeared. He handed me the keys to this small but cozy apartment and told me it was all mine. Stunned and grateful also, I couldn't stand but hugged him hard. By the way, where did you go? Nowhere special. Felt suffocated, so I left. This time, Charles was like a different person towards me. He visited me every day and even helped me sell my paintings. Over time, my feelings for him grew and we started dating. Our relationship was filled with warmth and affection, and every moment spent together felt like a dream come true. Only, I felt so guilty keeping my dating history with Brad a secret from him, but the fear of losing him loomed over me. If he knew I'd approached him with hidden motives at the beginning, he'd despise me forever. But I had to at least tell him something. Be careful around Brad. I don't think he's a good guy. I know. He's a gold digger that's part of a romance scam ring, targeting rich women to blackmail them. Wow. Charles sure knew his stuff. Hang on. Does it mean that Brad intended on blackmailing me too? When I'd been rich? I'm going to expose him at the wedding ceremony. Come with me. Today is D-Day. The Grand Hall was drowned in the ethereal glow of lights. Standing in the center were Brad and Diana, ready to exchange lifelong vows. All eyes were fixed on them. Out of a sudden, the whole hall went dark, and an anonymous face appeared on the screen behind them. Tonight, we bring the spotlight on our group. Unbeknownst to many, our Brad Thomas is, in reality, Jackson Lloyd, born and raised in Pennsylvania by his father, Richie Lloyd the ringleader of scams to trick rich women into marriage and con them out of their fortune. Then the evidence of Brad being affectionate with innocent victims started appearing on the screen. After that, the spotlight immediately stopped on Brad, who was about to flee the scene. Diana roared in anger, rushing there right then and flung a glass of wine right at his face. The whole crowd started to murmur. Hang on, everyone. The party's not over yet. Check their menus to reveal the other accomplice. Everyone frantically checked, but then looked bewildered to see all the menus were empty. All except for mine, where there was a photo of me and Brad. So since the beginning, Charles already knew about my relationship with Brad? And he thinks I'm Brad's accomplice? I turned to Charles, but he immediately let go of my hand. We're over. This whole time, Charles played me like a hurtful trick, and even thought me capable of something truly awful. I messaged him to meet me by this lake where we used to go. It had been one hour, but he hadn't shown up. This might be the final nail in the coffin of our relationship. Just as I was about to let go, I saw him trudging towards me. Charles, listen to me. I'm not with Brad. I tried warning you about him. I heard the whole sneaky conversation of you two. Your love words and your filthy plan on my family. Then my private detective sent me those photos of you both together that proved me right. You hired someone to spy on me? Not you, Brad. That's why I left home. I thought you were my friend. And I thought we were more than friends. Brad and I did date in the past, but that's all. He tried to use me just like he used others. My feelings for you are real. You have to trust me. So? I didn't know about the scam. I'm sorry I ever fell for Brad's lies and first approached you. He told me your mom was involved with my father's downfall, and I guess I still wanted my daddy to be innocent, but I stupidly believed him. Charles didn't utter a word. He just turned around and left. But hang on! (laughs) May I ask, why didn't you publicize my face in that picture with Brad? I just wanted you to know what it felt like to be hurt. But I couldn't bear to see you hurt either. Let me go. I need some time. Then he left me there, watching him disappear in the dark as the world around me collapsed. After the rain, the sun finally shines again. The police finally caught up with Brad and his dad and locked them both up. Diana tracked me down and apologized to me. She asked me to go back to the villa and paint for her, but I refused. I can't keep on being so trusting and relying on others so much. It's time for me to believe in myself and stand on my own two feet. And more importantly, 
I couldn't face him anymore. Hi, it's Vicky again, but in a fancier version. After all the sweat and tears, I finally made it as an artist. I was just chosen to collaborate on an important art project with this big company, and my life would turn a new page upon opening this door. Charles! Hey, I'm Lydia. It might seem like this enchanting forest is real, but it's even better. It's VR, and you're looking at its creator. This is nature at its most perfect form, unpolluted, a home to many wild creatures. Those are actually my friend's avatars. One of them is Layla, my best friend, my only real life friend. All the kids used to think I was a freak for my obsession with plants and nature. Then I met Layla, who was also a nature geek in the neighborhood. I knew right away that she and I were going to be best of friends. We loved all the same weird things, like pickled garlic and growing peppers to make pepper spray. We were basically inseparable, and with Layla by my side, I couldn't care less about what the other kids said anymore. But my world suddenly turned upside down when Layla graduated high school and had to move out for college. Saying goodbye filled me with sadness and fear. Layla was my only friend, and I would feel lost without her. So she came up with the idea of using VR to keep me company. Little did I know, it completely changed my life. VR opened a whole new world for me, giving me the tools to build the land of my dreams, a place where Layla and I could hang out and explore nature the way we used to. Soon enough, I quickly got a grasp on VR and became a big name player in the game. Before long, my life was more virtual than reality. Suddenly, everything was black. I took off the VR headset and mom and dad were standing at the door. Why are you still here? It's the middle of the school day, for God's sake. You've had your head buried in that game since your junior year. Enough is enough. You know what? We've been too easy on her. You need to get into a college at the end of the school year, or we will kick you out of this house. Then how am I supposed to play VR? You know it's my life. Not my problem. You're 18. It's time for you to grow up and face reality. Mom! I'm with your dad on this. Now hurry up and get to school. Later, I reached out to Layla for help. Why don't you apply to my college? Huh, that seems like a good idea. I'd get to see you in person again. Right? You'll be out of your parents' reach, and it's an easy school to get into. They just need your high school transcript. Simple. Girl, say no more. Sign me in. Months passed, and it was finally college admission day. Man, it is packed here. Where could I find the school garden? There it is. But where's Layla? There was only a boy sitting here reading a book. He was literally glowing in the sunshine. He suddenly looked up and our eyes met. Ah, oh, that was so awkward. Lydia! Oh my god, I'm so glad you're here. Finally, we've reunited after two years. Layla, I missed you too. I, oh, you look different. The girl standing in front of me was totally dolled up from top to toes. What happened to her? Oh, you know, I found my style ever since I got here. Don't worry, I'll help you out with your style too. But I like my style. Anyway, do you know what major you're in? I haven't decided yet. Better hurry up. Our school has a rule. To stay here, you have to choose a major within your first week. But no biggie, just go to my department. Greenhouse. I'm the class president now. Come on, I'll show you around. Then, Layla led me to her department infrastructure, and I was absolutely impressed. It was equipped with modern experiment and technology and exotic plants. Right then, a group of students swept past me and flocked around Layla. She introduced them as her new friends, but they just gave me the screening from head to toe, then straight up ignored me. Ugh, rude. Whatever, I need some alone VR time anyway. I put on the headset and doing some boxing moves, but accidentally knocked over something in real life. Layla, why is your friend wearing the VR thing and breaking our stuff? Don't you dare tell me she's from VR. No, no, no. She just uses VR since she's socially anxious. I'll talk to her. Lydia, listen, if you're going to become a greenhouse major, you have to lay off the VR a little bit. You can't be carrying the headset around campus, okay? I confusedly nodded my head. Isn't she also playing VR with me all the time, though? Afterwards, I went to get settled into my dorm room to find a girl playing my fave VR motorcycle race while riding her hoverboard. She's good, but I'm the boss of this game. Instantly, I joined the race and quickly passed her. But man, this girl was fierce. We ended up reaching the finish line at the same time. Whoa, that was epic! I'm Lydia, by the way. It's my first day and I'm assigned to this room. You must be my roommate? Yep, I'm Christine, class president of the VR department. You seem to know VR really well. How long have you been playing? I'm kinda new. Just started two years ago. Sheesh. You've got games, girl. Wanna join our department? 
The next day, Christine showed me around the VR department, which was full of the newest techs. Dude, this is so sick! Every week, we have an exhibition of new VR technology, and we mainly work and interact in VR. No need for awkward real-life convo. Besides, our department also joined the school annual creativity competition for the huge prize of $10,000, which we could use to develop more modern VR technology. Whoa! This place was heaven! Just imagine playing VR all day, every day! Holy moly, can it be? Soccer shots enhanced? I joined in the game immediately and gave it a big kick, scoring a goal! Wait, did I break the pots again? I took off my headset to see a guy doubled over in pain. Oh god, I'm so sorry. Don't worry, I'm good, I'm fine. His face seemed awfully familiar. Oh, I remember you from the school garden the other day. Yeah, that was me. I'm Marshall. Thinking about applying to VR? Yeah, I'm Lydia. Lydia, I think you'd like it here. I suddenly felt my face getting hot when I was saved by a phone call from Layla. I quickly excused myself and ran right into her. Hey, I've been looking everywhere for you. There's a welcome party tonight, and you're definitely going. N no, no party. Oh, come on. I'll introduce you to our research group. You've heard about the creativity competition for departments, right? Greenhouse is in it to win it. But no buts. Let's get ready. At the party, Layla dragged me to where the greenhouse kids were hanging out. They were still glaring at me. I should just leave, but on my way out, I bumped into Marshall. Hey, Lydia, I was looking for you. You dropped this handkerchief back at the VR department. It's from your grandma, right? Oh, my God, thank you. But how come you know it's my grandma's? Uh, um, I just guess. I... I saw your initials on it. Hey, back off, you VR freaks! Stop talking with our new member! Poof, are you sure? This morning she seemed really fond of all our gizmos and gadgets. What are you talking about? Lydia, explain this! What's there to explain? Your pea brain can't read between the lines, huh? Layla lunged at Christine and a fist fight broke out between them. That's why I don't fit in in social gatherings. Hey, wanna get out of here? Yes, please. Marshall explained that there was beef between the VR and greenhouse departments. They were neck and neck for many things, especially the scholarship competition. But sometimes, both went too far. The greenhouse put insects in the VR facility rooms, which chewed up all their cables. To get back at them, the VR messed with the water system in the greenhouse, which caused water blackout and killed dozens of plants. And naturally, the presidents, Layla and Christine, were always at each other's throats. Shoot, I was planning on choosing VR as my major, but that would mean turning myself into her enemy. What am I supposed to do? I tried turning back to VR to take my mind off things, but I could hardly concentrate. Lydia, why is your head stuck in the clouds? I've been thinking. I want to be in the VR department. Greenhouse is good, but I'm not sure it's for me. I just don't want us to be enemies. It's okay. We're still friends no matter what you decide. Just follow what feels good in your heart. Aw, she'd put me above all her rivalries? She hadn't changed so much after all. First thing the next morning, I went to apply to the VR department, then caught sight of Layla. Hey, Layla! I made my decision. I've applied for VR department. What? You can't be serious! Choosing VR would mean you're just throwing away your dream and living in an unreal fantasy. Unreal? It's more real than the cool girl with hot friends thing you've got going. And why would you tell me to follow my heart when you clearly didn't think I should? I, I told you that? I nodded my head, confused. I might have slipped my tongue or something. Just think about it again. Something was off. I swear she really seemed genuine yesterday. Over day, I got back to my dorm room only to find out my headset cracked and wouldn't turn on. Who did this? Freaked out, I only thought of one person who could help me fix it now. Marshall. It would take a few days to fix it. Oh no, I couldn't pass a day without VR. <laughs> I think you'll find something to do. Like what? You're more than welcome to hang here. Dang, this guy's cheeky. Suddenly, Marshall's phone rang, and he excused himself for a few minutes. I looked around his room and noticed two VR headsets on the table. Maybe Marshall wouldn't bother if I borrowed a spare set, right? As it turned on, my own forest appeared in front of me. Was he following me? I clicked on his profile to see. He was logged in as Layla. My friend Layla. So, the Layla I've been talking to was not the real Layla, but Marshall? How long had this been going on? And did Marshall know me from the beginning? Lydia? I took off the headset to see Marshall standing there, stunned. What's this? Explain to me now! It all started when I got my department's pricey drone stuck on the roof of the greenhouse building. Layla was up there, so I begged her to give it back to me. She only agreed under one condition, that I had to use her VR account to play with you, without telling you that. At first, I only did it as part of the deal, but after a while, I find her the funniest, smartest, and most creative girl, and I couldn't help but spending time with you. 
You're telling me that this whole year I've been talking to someone I thought was my best friend, but it was actually just some random guy, and you have the nerve to keep lying to me? Marshall, give me my VR, and stop hovering around Lydia or she's gonna find out. She already did. Lydia, I can explain. Was it because of the stupid rivalry between Greenhouse and VR? What's so important about it that you had to lie to your best friend? You've changed, Layla, and I don't think you're my friend anymore. I stormed off, fighting back tears. I couldn't look at either of them any longer. When I got back to my dorm, Christine was already there. I asked her about my VR headset. I actually saw that Layla around our room earlier. She must have done it. That was a low move, Layla. But I was too fed up with her to even be mad. The greenhouse department could be trying to sabotage us again. Now, this is war. I'm going to gather everyone so we can plan our counterattack. Whatever, this rivalry thing is ridiculous anyway. On my first VR free day, I was the only person in my class without their headset. Even the professors engaged through VR. All I could do was sit and stare at people, which reminded me of those lonely days before Layla came into my life. The next few days kept on repeating themselves, until one day, my body started boiling, and my head was buzzing like it was full of bees. Professor, I'm not feeling well. I need to go back to my dorm. But he didn't flinch one bit. No one did, except this guy. Hey, need an aspirin? He extended out his hand, but there was nothing there. A virtual pill? Seriously? No, it doesn't work. Aw, oh, man. Bummer. I tried getting up, but my body grew heavy and weak. I kept calling Christine across the room, but no use. If only Layla was here to help me right now. No, Lydia. You can do this on your own. I leaned on the wall to prop myself up slowly, made my way back to the dorm. I was so close, but my knees trembled and I collapsed. Just then, someone came to scoop me into their arms and picked me up. I woke up in a bad headache to see Marshall cooling it down with a damp towel. Hey, you're awake. Here, have some soup and take some medicine. What are you doing here? I came to return your VR but saw you collapsing, so then I helped you into bed. I know you don't want to talk to me right now, but this was urgent, so thank you, Marshall. I threw myself into his arms and burst into tears. I thought no one was gonna help me. He wrapped his arms around me and I finally felt safe. The next day, thanks to Marshall, I felt loads better. So I went to watch the department's creativity contest. The greenhouse presented their newly bred plant species and got the highest score so far. VR, on the other hand, wasn't so lucky. Our newest development in headsets, uh, exploded. Christine didn't take it well. I tried to comfort her, but she just brushed me off and stormed away. Suddenly, Layla rushed towards me and pulled me into a corner. Lydia, I just want to say I'm sorry. Ever since I got here, I became the center of attention in the VR department. And I got so wrapped up in it. I had to give up playing VR with you. I don't know, Layla. Why couldn't you just tell me that? I didn't want you to be alone. You were always online, so I guess you didn't make any friends back home. That's true. This might sound ridiculous, but only now have I realized that VR isn't everything. No virtual reality can replace the real world. And real friendship goes through all kinds of ups and downs. But it lasts, just like you and I. I'm glad you realized that. And I just want to let you know, no matter what department you choose, I'll support you. Unconditionally. Thanks. But hey, why did you break my VR headset, though? Your VR? No, I didn't do it. I swear. Then how come Christine blamed it on you? I ran down to my dorm to confront Christine, but she wasn't there, and she didn't return for the rest of the night. When I got to class the next day, I put on my headset and found the rest of the department ragging on me, calling me a liar and a traitor. Somehow, pictures of me and Layla talking yesterday were plastered all over the virtual world. The audacity of you to come back here. We already know the greenhouse department is using you to spy on us. It was you who messed with our invention at the department contest. Otherwise, how could it explode? They started booing and surrounding me, so I ran for my life until a hand grabbed mine. You could run for real, you know. Ah, uh, yes, at least I'm not the only one virtually running. We made it to the building's entrance, just as the greenhouse student dragging Christine towards us, and the VR students caught up with us. Layla, what's going on? We caught this girl starting a fire in our greenhouse lab with her hoverboard, then tried to flee the scene. What? Why would you do that? It's not on purpose, okay? Then tell us the truth, now. 
fine. So a day before the department's competition, I secretly made an adjustment to the VR model, but somehow it caused an error and we ended up losing the prize. I was so mad that I decided to take it out on this greenhouse bunch. Last night, I snuck into your lab, trying to take away all of your research. But suddenly, my hoverboard overheated and exploded, causing a fire to spread everywhere. I freaked out and left. You know the rest. Yeah, thanks to you, our lab was burnt to the ground. You're lucky no one got hurt. And you had the nerve to blame Lydia for losing the contest. I had to, otherwise the entire department is on to me. Oh, not just the VR department. Now everyone was furious at this crazy manipulative witch. What about my VR headset? Did you break it too? Well, that's just a little trick to get you and Layla to fight. You do belong to VR department after all. That means no making friends with Greenhouse. Right, guys? Guys? You've gone too far this time, Christine. And this rivalry thing is ridiculous anyway. Look where it got you. The VR students couldn't have agreed more. They immediately voted to impeach Christine from her class president role before turning her into the administration. They then apologized on Christine's behalf and offered to help the Greenhouse rebuild their lab. Of course, Layla and the Greenhouse department agreed. It looked like the start of a beautiful partnership. Within a few months, in collaboration with the VR department, the greenhouse was completely remodeled and renovated. No one even cared to mention the feud between the two departments anymore. And guess what? I applied for a second major in greenhouse. Double majoring was tough, but I had the support of Layla and Marshall and our friends in both departments. Speaking of Marshall, he wanted to take me somewhere special in the real world. He covered my eyes and led me there. Now you can look. I could have sworn I was in the VR world, but I wasn't. I could feel and smell the flowers, the soft grass, and Marshall's warm hand holding mine. Lydia, I've been wanting to tell you this for a long time. <clears throat> I don't want to be your virtual friend, or even a friend in real life. I wanted more, so would you like to be my girlfriend? Are you kidding me? Yes, yes, yes! <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Kaylee from Washington. I might dress like a boy, but I'm actually the girliest girl you could ever meet. Before I continue, please like and subscribe. I was born with shiny blonde hair and blue eyes, just like my mom. I never met my dad, but it wasn't really a big deal. There's no need to live in some fancy castle to feel like a princess. I was already one in my mom's eyes. She always pampered me with the cutest things in the world. You could give Rapunzel a run for her money, sweetheart. But tragically, mom left me in an accident when I was 10, and I had to move in with Selena, my mom's friend. She lived in a mansion where there were so many people dressed just like her. As soon as they saw me, they started to ooh and ah at me. What a porcelain doll. Bet she'll win any beauty pageants. She's just too lovely to be real. Shh, Miss Sanchez here doesn't like anyone who's prettier than her daughter. Yeah, she's been in a foul mood ever since the master left for his mistress. I only caught a bit of what they said before Selena dragged me into a corner. Sweetie, you heard them. Boys are bad news. Just look at your dad, for example. So stay away from them. Got it? Um... And the only way to repel them is if you look more like them. Then she told me to wear contact lenses to hide my blue eyes, cut my long locks, threw away my dress collection, and bought me clothes that basically drowned me. And voila, I looked just like a teenage boy. One day, I was alone in the kitchen when I heard someone shouting, Bring me two smoothies now! I brought in two avocado shakes, but accidentally splashed one all over this girl's face, turning her into Shrek. Watch what you're doing! My daughter's angel face is destined to be Miss USA! How dare you! I, I'm sorry, ma'am. Relax, mom. Avocado face masks are all the rage anyway. Sadly, I still had to take my punishment, but suddenly the girl walked towards me. Hey, I'm Beatrix. Let's go and play. But I'm... Don't worry, I'm here. My mom won't punish you anymore. Then she took me to her room. Wow, she even has a castle inside? Beatrix then put some wigs and makeup on me. I looked at myself in the mirror, and memories of my mom came rushing back. I quickly pulled out the photo of her that I carried with me all the time. We looked so alike. I was about to take my lenses out, when Selena stormed in and dragged me back to my room. Don't you ever let me catch you here again, and keep your distance from Little Mistress. We're not from the same world as people like them, remember that? But little did Selena know, Beatrix had just asked her mom to allow me to go to school with her. And ever since then, we've been literally inseparable. I mean literally. She clung to me from living room to kitchen, from home to school. 
Honestly, the only time I could have a moment of peace was when I went to the restroom. Phew. Oh, maybe not. And each time we hung out was more than torture. I had to fight against the urge to act girly, hit my own hands whenever they started to reach for those pretty things, and now they ended up swollen. Think I'll glue them in my pockets next time. Then, one day, I arrived at school to the most terrible news ever! Kaylee, one of our female rugby players got injured, so I put you on the team. What on earth? I don't even know what rugby is! Here's Austin, your rugby coach. If you need anything, he's your guy. You know him? He might be handsome, but something about him screams bad news. People call him Awful Austin. You better watch out. And she wasn't exaggerating at all. On the very first day, he already pushed me to my absolute limits in training, but I almost passed out. In the agility ladder exercises, I got my feet tangled up in the line and fell to the ground. But instead of a hand, all I got was his soulless look. Then one time, I missed the ball, causing it to hit another player. Hey, is this a joke to you? Do it properly. Keeping all Celine's words in mind, I zipped my mouth up and ignored him, who was definitely a boy. Oi, what's the attitude? You're bringing the whole team down. See? Cat got your tongue? Faking dumb doesn't work here. From tomorrow, extra training. No excuses. Beatrix was right. He was a devil. I was dragging my aching body home after training. When I noticed a cute cat and stopped to pet it, the cat ran away, so I followed it and ended up at the back gate of the school, which was totally off limits. I've never been here before. Whoa, look at this beautiful mural. It's so mesmerizing. What you doing here? Awful Austin? Uh, um, I just... Anyway, did you paint this? It's amazing. Of course not. Stop crying. He was such a terrible liar. But to be honest, I didn't expect some jock like him to be interested in art, let alone actually be good at it. What are you two doing here? Don't move! Oh no! The guard has spotted us! Austin immediately grabbed my hands and started running. We hid in a small alley, and he pressed me against the wall with his strong arms. My heart was racing like crazy, and I could feel his too. We were so close that our faces were only inches apart, and the warmth of his breath made me blush even more, so I accidentally let out a squeal. Thankfully, before things could get any more awkward, the guard was gone. Don't even think of breathing a single word about this. Weirdly, this time his words didn't hurt at all. Maybe because I knew, beneath his tough jock exterior, he had his own secret, just like me. I like your painting, so no need to hide it. Austin stopped for a bit, then kept walking, but I'm sure I caught a smile. After that day, he started to behave quite differently, more gently. He no longer went berserk at me, but helped me get through the training instead so I could catch up with the other players. I just had my first successful kick. Yay! I turned around to cheer with Austin, but out of nowhere, the ball came hurtling right at me, and he instantly caught it with one hand, while the other held me by the waist. Okay, that was awkward. This week, there'd be a senior prom at school, and Beatrix insisted we go. Of course, I gave her a no, but she was literally a leech, so I had no other choice. Wear this, Kay. It's a matching set. It'll be so lame if I wear this alone, please. Fine, but only because you've given me no choice. Yay, love ya. Eek! Wow, it smelled so good. What if I put it on? But wait, what about Selena? Forget it. It's not like she'll be at the prom. YOLO. I stepped into the ballroom with this gorgeous outfit on, my blue eyes, and the necklace my mom gave me. Everyone jaw dropped as soon as they saw me, and that's when I noticed Austin coming towards me. Hey, you look different tonight. Uh, I mean in a good way. Wanna dance? Sorry, girls time. Kaylee, look at the tasty food corner. Told you we had to come here. Oh, Beatrix, my friend here is starving. Can you show him where to grab a bite? Wow, sure handsome. We have cupcakes, biscuits, uh, and even brownies. Isn't this called choosing boys over friends? <laughs> Good for her, anyway. <laughs> then Austin gently led me in the waltz. He looked exactly like a prince from a fairy tale. As we fell in step, letting the rhythm control our movements, I felt my whole body tingle. The sparks were definitely flying. But suddenly, the music changed into trance. We looked into each other's eyes for a second. Then, hand in hand, ran across the crowd until we got outside. I could never imagine a tomboy could become like this. Actually, I'm not a tomboy. What do you mean? 
That's when I decided to tell him everything about how I was obsessed with girly things but had to suppress it all my life. It felt so good to let it all out after burying it the whole time. And Austin was such a good listener. Wow, Kaylee, I'm so sorry. Actually, I've also had to hide my passion for arts to help my father's business too. So what you said to me the other day really opened up something in me. So things were not easy for him either, huh? Suddenly, he pulled out a sketchbook and started drawing me. I wish this moment would last forever. His face then went all serious, but not in a cold way as usual, but instead beaming with passion. Our eyes met, and I thought my heart was going to jump out of my chest. And yes, I hope this moment would last forever too. Then suddenly, he leaned closer to fix my hair. I was ready for a kiss. Then, Kaylee! Selena, how did she find out about this? Man, you know what's coming next. I can't believe you'd be this reckless. You're not my mom, and not every boy is like my dad. You were wrong. Mind your manners. Get changed now. Right then, Mrs. Sanchez came to interrupt us. Hang on, are her eyes blue? And what's this? Uh, um, don't mind her. I bought this half price at the swap meet, ma'am. Then she signaled for me to flee the scene. If mom were here, she'd understand the way I feel. Blinking back tears, I suddenly felt a warm hand on my shoulder. Are you alright? I saw you leave with Austin. Did he cut your hair? It looks shorter. I'm okay, Beatrix. Oh wow, I have a similar necklace that my dad gave to me. This was from my dad too, except that I don't actually know who he is. Maybe your dad is my dad? <laughs> Zero for the joke, Beatrix. Oh, but why did Selena lie about the necklace to Miss Sanchez? So I went to find Selena right after, and she told me the most shocking thing ever. Beatrix's dad, the former master here, was actually my dad. He seduced mom, who used to be a maid here too. When Mrs. Sanchez found out, both of them were kicked out of the house. Then knowing mom was having me, he dumped her right away. Selena was afraid Mrs. Sanchez could see mom in me, and so she had to force me to disguise myself. Wow, this was seriously messed up. Keep your identity a secret by all means or we're doomed. Understand? I was in complete shock, but I knew I had to be more careful from then on. For the whole week after, Mrs. Sanchez seemed to be in a good mood. One day, she even asked me to go shopping with her. But a wedding dress studio? Is there a wedding coming, ma'am? Yes, and it's yours, you filth. You have to pay for your mom's karma for stealing my husband. So she knew everything? I tried to bolt away, but immediately got caught. Then she took me to this luxurious house, and guess who I met? Kaylee, what are you doing here? Uh, Austin? W what? What do you want? I was still bewildered when a man pushed a boy in a wheelchair into the living room. Hi, Mr. Fisher, about our arrangement. This is the bride here. She and Ivan here will make the perfect couple. Hope you like this gift as my thanks for your favor. My blessings for the marriage and your family. Dad, what is she talking about? Ivan will get married to this girl. I've already settled everything so that Ivan can have a bright future without worrying about anything. Excuse me? I've had to put aside my art dream to enroll in business school, as you wished, and now you want to control my brother's life too? I object to this marriage, because I love her! Then he pulled me away, leaving Mr. Fisher frozen in shock. Kaylee, I'm so sorry you had to meet my dad in such an awful way. I promise to never let anyone treat you like this again. No worries, I have to thank you instead. Your words really woke up the courage in me. Austin offered to help me talk things out, but it's time for me to fight for my own good. I came back home to see Mrs. Sanchez flying into a rage. How dare you bring your face back into this house! You cruel woman! I will not marry someone else just to pay off your debt! Right at that moment, Selena walked in, and she literally turned into a bull. How dare you do that to my child! I had to stop her from lunging towards Mrs. Sanchez. So how about what you all have done to me? Do you know what I've been through all these years? Her mom stole my husband, and you just expect me to put it aside? Then, she collapsed and burst into tears. Suddenly, I felt bad for her. I'm sorry for everything that happened to you, but it doesn't mean you have to punish yourself with it, or grant yourself the right to dictate others like that. She owes you nothing, and you have no right to control others' lives. Right after that, Selena and I packed our stuff and left the house. Walking through that door, we felt more free than ever before. After all that drama, it took us some time to get our lives back on track. 
From all the money Selena had saved working as a maid, she was able to open her own bakery and take back control of our lives. And so do I. Finally, I'm back to my princess style. But after all those craziest things happened, something never changed. Oh my god, oh my god, we're half-sisters! Yay! Ah, uh, my mom said she felt so guilty about what happened, but asked me to keep it a secret. Oops. And about that guy, you ask? He worked things out with his dad. And guess what? He's in art school now. Okay, now tilt your head to the right. Yeah, like that. Gosh, that dress makes you look like a fairy princess. Who dare to make a princess stay still like a statue for more than one hour? Huh? The charming artist? Shh, it's almost done. I beg your pardon. Hi, I'm Aubrey, a super smart girl with an IQ of 200, and you should be ready for my mind-blowing story. Before I continue, please like and subscribe. I grew up in a small village in the countryside where people farm for a living. My family struggled to put food on the table so I could only attend a monastery school. But since childhood, I've always been kind of different. The system is crashing. Please wait for a moment. The chicken is $15.55 minus 15%. Cereal is $2.49. Potatoes, laundry detergent. So the total comes to $64.85 with the discounts and tax included. Mom soon realized I was a gifted child, so she helped me skip some grades. And by the age of five, I was already doing secondary school math. I always topped my classes and other students would bribe me with candies to ask for help with their homework. At the age of eight, I scored 760 on the SAT math and won the spelling bee competition. I became a phenomenon in the area, and reporters even gave me the Stanford Bennett IQ test, which showed I had the same intelligence as a 22-year and 11-month-old person. My parents were super proud of me, especially my dad. Dad, they all gave me Lego and comics for rewards, as if I was an eight-year-old. Yeah, yeah, they're wrong. You're eight years and five months old already, little lady. He was the only one who could spark interesting conversations with me. That is, until he felt terribly ill. But good surgeons were nowhere to be found in this remote countryside, and we couldn't afford to take him to the center either. We were desperate to see a situation get worse and worse. Then he passed away, leaving us in the depths of despair. Soon after, Mom couldn't afford my school fees anymore, so I had to drop out. Aubrey, I'm so sorry. Don't worry, Mom. There's nothing that school can teach that I can't learn by myself. So she signed me up for a library membership and turned out the best memories I cherished were here, where I could immerse myself in interesting knowledge from all around the world. I was walking down the aisle, absentmindedly running my fingers along the spines of the books, when one caught my eye. And the memories of my dad rushed back to me. If he had been operated on, he'd not have lost. I started turning the first few pages and was captivated immediately. Then suddenly, a fiery desire sparked in my heart. I want to become a surgeon. So I studied every medical book I could find, especially the ones from this author, and decided to save money to enter medical school as soon as possible. To get closer to my dream, I moved out to the city and applied for a job at a coffee shop right next to the medical school. Only... You've broken 10 plates this week already. Are you trying to break a record? Come on, boss. It's just some plates. Not like I burned the whole shop or something. This will be deducted from your salary. Repeat this and you'll be fired. Okay, that's my fault, but I knew he wouldn't fire me. There's no one else who could memorize so many orders all at once. Even Diner Dash Master. Later, I was going to serve a group of students when I heard they were discussing an emergency case. We have to remove that blood clot in segment four of the liver and flush the left lobe. Definitely have to start at the middle hepatic vein. Is this dude serious? Absolutely not. A less intrusive cut would be along the falciform ligament to allow access to segment three. Everyone fell silent and looked at me like I was an alien. Suddenly, the middle-aged man among them stood up. Nice work, young lady. Your method is much more efficient than my student's answer. Which class are you in? Oh, I'm not a medical student but I aspire to be one day. The man asked me to sit down and continued asking me other medical questions, and I answered them all with ease. My adrenaline was rushing. Since my dad passed away, I hadn't had such an interesting discussion. Then, a few days later, the man came back and revealed that he was Dr. Sean Lewis and the principal of the medical school. OMG, you're my favorite author! I admire you so much! Thank you, young lady. Anyway, I came here today with an offer. 
I was impressed by the knowledge you have in the medical field, and I think you deserve a full expense scholarship to the most prestigious medical school. Can someone pinch me now? This was truly a blessing from heaven that I would definitely not let slip away. Here comes my first day. I went to school extra early to explore as much of the campus as possible. This place was so much bigger and better equipped than my old school. I was looking around the hallway to find my class when someone bumped into me. Oh, isn't it the gave the wrong answer guy at the cafe? He just coldly said sorry and hastily headed to the class over there. 412? It's my class too. I learned that he was Henry, the top student of the class. But obviously he wasn't that good. They'll see. All the theoretical classes didn't make me break a sweat, and I even spotted some mistakes made by the professors. When lunch rolled around, I went to the cafeteria, approaching the first group that caught my eye, and they seemed to be friendly. Want some of my fries? Potato fries contain a high amount of trans fat, which is associated with type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and obesity. One day you'll have a stroke, and then you'll know why. Thank me later. They all pouted and left right away. Did I say something wrong? Right then, a nice girl came to me. I'm Laura. Mind if I sit? Sure. Then she told me she was isolated too, just because she wasn't as smart as the other students here. Why are they so mean? Hey, why you gotta be bothered by those toxic people? Do they give you a penny for your thoughts? It's not about how many friends you make. It's about finding one that knows your worth. You're right. I'm Aubrey, by the way. I know, I was in the same class with you this morning. And the way you argue with our professor? Wow, that's impressive. Laura and I quickly became friends. It's great to have her around, who could truly see my brilliance and always encouraged me to express myself. Today came a big event. A conference was held by none other than Dr. Lewis. But little did I know that this event would become a battleground between Henry and I. Determined to impress Dr. Lewis, I eagerly raised my hand at every opportunity to answer his inquiries. Each time I did, Henry would swiftly raise his hand as well, competing for Dr. Lewis's attention. We argued back and forth, neither backing down until the end of the conference. After that, Dr. Lewis announced that there was one slot available in his upcoming research project, which would go to the top student of this term. The room buzzed with excitement and anticipation. My heart skipped a beat, for working with Dr. Lewis had been a lifelong dream. However, other students started cheering Henry's name. Jeez, I swore I would beat his butt off and show them who deserved it. Time to prove that I was not only unmatched in theory, but also in practice. I was the very first one to finish stitching up the incision. Uh-huh. But as I reached for my gauze, I couldn't find it anywhere. It must be around here, I swear. Oh no, I left it inside the dummy. Okay, this time must be better. How hard could it be to use this defibrillator? But then I accidentally touched the metal pad and got shocked and fell backward. I kept trying in many other practice sessions, but that sucked. Aubrey, this cast looks exactly like a chicken thigh. Do it again. But the most annoying thing was that Henry excelled in all of them and other students started mocking me. After that, I went outside for some fresh air and deep down, I was so disappointed in myself for all my failures. Suddenly, a hand gently patted my shoulder. It was Laura. I couldn't help but hug her and start sobbing. Laura, what if I was wrong about myself? I failed at everything and people started humiliating me. Oh, they just envy you. Nobody can beat your academic scores. That's why they gloated at your failure in practice. But that big brain of yours is what matters the most, right? Y yeah And an opportunity is coming your way. There's an intelligence contest next week. If you win, everyone will have to recognize that you're the best, including Henry. Talk about Laura, my savior. I'll try my best. Just wait and see. A few days later, Laura took me to the library in a private study room. She helped me set up my laptop and left me alone so I could focus. Good luck. I participated in an online oral contest over Skype. There was a panel of judges who asked questions, and all I had to do was answer them verbally. Easy peasy. Now I just need to wait for the results. The next day, I went to school as usual, but then suddenly was called to the principal's office. Dr. Lewis might have known about that competition and saw my name on the top list. I was about to brag about my performance when he accused me of helping other students cheat on their exam. Then he showed me a voice recording of me answering the questions. Wasn't that for the intelligence contest? But Laura said, Dr. Lewis, just wait. I can explain. I frantically called Laura, but she refused to pick up. Enough. I'm so disappointed in you. You're expelled from this moment. Feeling lost and crushed, I trudged myself to a bench in the schoolyard. Hey, are you okay? 
Okay? You're mocking me? Now that project slot is yours. Happy much? Get out of my sight now! Suddenly a stack of papers fell onto my lap. You might need this. Good luck. I believe you're not a cheater. I confusedly flipped through those papers to see that these were all of Henry's notes from the semester for practice lessons, which could not be found in normal textbooks or lectures. I kept on turning to the last page and saw a scribble. Know your worth. Something awakened inside me, so I swallowed my pride and ran after Henry. Hey, wait! I I've been wrong about you the whole time. I'm sorry. Don't be. It's my fault to act competitively, too. I had no bad intentions. It was just the motivation for me to study harder. I swear. But it's a pity if the medical industry loses someone like you. Um, well, I'm not so sure anymore. I'm used to doing everything so quickly and I can't be patient, which probably explains my clumsiness. That I can help with. Genius is 1% talent and 99% hard work, you know. Since then, I often went to Henry's house to practice. We studied together and he taught me many tips to stay calm, patient, and focused. And turns out, he's also quite the adorable type. Here you go. Thank you, doctor. This is the best stitch I've ever had. One day, I ran into Laura at a gas station. She tried to hide, but I ran straight there to catch her. How could you trick me like that and just disappear like nothing happened? I'm so sorry, Aubrey. I was so blind and just wanted to help those who are bad at studying like me. I never expected it to be that serious and you'd get expelled. And now, why are you here? It's just the medical profession was not my thing, so I quit. But Aubrey, please forgive me. I'm really ashamed of what I did and you were... The only one who had truly been kind to me. <sighs> only when you set things straight and confess everything to Dr. Lewis. But even so, there isn't a likely chance we'll be friends again. So the next day, Henry took Laura and I to see Dr. Lewis. Aubrey? Laura? What are you both doing here? Dr. Lewis, I... I was the one behind the cheating case. Aubrey had no idea and didn't deserve to be punished for my fault. I've been practicing a lot too, sir. Look at these. I've been so careful with every single one. Aubrey has also helped me a lot in our project. I hope you can forgive her and grant her another chance. Dr. Lewis looked quite satisfied, but then he suddenly turned pensive and shook his head. Medical school is not where people can freely join and leave. A doctor needs an extra sharp mind and can be fooled as easily as you were. I'm sorry, Aubrey, but you're not qualified. My heart sank to my toes and I locked myself inside my apartment for the next couple of days. It wasn't until Henry knocked at my door that I actually went outside. He said he wanted to cheer me up and bring me to his favorite restaurant. I sat down waiting while Henry went to get the drinks. Hey! But a second later, he slipped on the stairs and fell down with a thud with all the broken glass scattering around. It's all right. I, I think I only twisted my ankle. Not a big deal. But my stomach dropped when I noticed a trail of blood on the floor and something protruding from his ankle. A large shard of glass. I swiftly dialed a 911 while Henry winced in pain. Aubrey, you have to administer first aid. Oh, right. I called for the restaurant staff to get the first aid kit, but it was clear that the situation was dire. Henry's face grew pale as blood continued to trickle from the wound. I held the wound closed to stop the blood, but my heart felt weak. I couldn't bear to see him suffer. You trust me, Henry? What do you mean? Yes? So I immediately pulled out the toolkit that I brought around in my purse. Henry bit down on the tablecloth beside us, and I started the procedure. I maintained a steady stream of chatter, trying to distract him from the pain, but it wasn't helping. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. What? Just to distract myself from the pain. Okay, go ahead. Stand a little taller. And done. When I looked up, there was a crowd cheering in awe and admiration. Guys, I caught the whole thing live. The video of the incident quickly went viral. That night, I tossed and turned in bed, unable to contain my excitement. I saved a human life! Reading the comments of the video filled me with a renewed sense of motivation to pursue my dream. The following morning, I was jolted awake by a notification on my phone. It was an email from Dr. Lewis himself. I headed to Dr. Lewis's office, and to my surprise, he told me he saw the video and gently said, Aubrey, I was once like you, arrogant and overly reliant on my natural intelligence. Then, a mistaken surgery left me with regret that I will carry with me for the rest of my life. However, after watching the video, I'm glad that you changed. I saw your humility and eagerness to learn, so I'll give you another chance. 
So here I am. You have no idea how much I miss this hallway. Welcome back. How's your ankle doing? Much better, thanks to you. How about a celebration dinner tonight? Sounds great, but promise you won't need me to operate on you again. I was scared to death. Ahead of me still lay a long road, but I believe the day I become a skilled surgeon is closer than ever. And soon I can perform more life-saving surgeries for the less fortunate. Dad, I will make you proud. It was the final match. My team, the Bulldogs, were neck on neck with our opponent, the Knights. Declan passed me the ball and I sprinted towards the goal, outrunning all the chasing Knights players. Suddenly, this guy cut me off and tackled me to the ground. I managed to break free, lunging towards the goal, and scored a triumphant touchdown. My teammates and I were celebrating when I saw the player who tackled me, Cody, talking to the ref and pointing at me. Suddenly, the ref blew his whistle. She's a girl, I could tell when I tackled her. She's a girl, so what? Why is a girl on a boys football team playing as a dude? She's not even registered properly. But she's the best player who scored more points than anybody on the Knights team, alone, and the winning goal. Despite Declan and my teammates standing up for me, the ref announced it was an unfair score and gave the win to the Knights. Hey, it's okay, Riley. We had a good game and a good season because you're here. Right, guys? Yeah, I'm okay, guys. That player, Cody, you, sir, have made an enemy for life. Hi, I'm Riley, a tomboy through and through. I prefer getting down and dirty on the football field rather than fussing over makeup and boys. Ironically, Nola, the girliest girl you know, is my best friend since childhood, and also the only girlfriend I hang out with. But even then, sometimes Nola's feminine energy got out of control. Like today, when she's crying over some boy she was in a complicated relationship with. We've been together for a while when I saw him seeing another girl today. Yeah, things happen. I swear we locked eyes and he totally ignored me. What a jerk! Riley, you have to help me get back at him! What? No, I don't want to get mixed up in all this toxic drama! You should ask someone else. This guy is so charming that any other girl I'll ask will fall in love with him. But you, Riley, are the only one who would be immune to Cody's charm. Wait, Cody? Cody Nelson? The footballer? Yeah, I told you about him before! Shoot. I should have listened to Nola's boy dramas before, but whatever. Right. What Cody did to you is absolutely outrageous. We gotta teach him a lesson. And for you, Nola, I got your back. Okay, the plan is to ruin his image in front of other girls and make him fall in love with you all at the same time. And then we'll dump him right away, breaking his little heart. But we need to give you a makeover as he only has eyes for girly girls. Nola then called Halsey, a makeup artist from the school over. Yeah, we definitely can seduce a guy with this. I bet lots of girls are falling for you instead. Nola and Halsey then dragged me into a clothing store. The minute I saw racks lined with dresses, my first instinct was to run. I had to try on dozens of dresses, and Halsey trained me to walk like a lady. They even talked about a curtsy? Who curtsies anymore? Then Halsey taught me how to slow dance, which I quickly mastered, but they didn't seem impressed. Halsey suddenly grabbed my waist and took the lead. I was following her steps when, OMG, they look so cute, eek! Only girls understand each other. What? Do we look like a couple to them? Stay cool, Riley, this is just for revenge. Nola's plan better be worth it. The next day, I brought my princess makeover to school, ready for Cody, when, hey, you look familiar. Have I met you before? Oh shoot, it's him. Did he recognize me from the match? I know, must have seen you in my dreams. Phew, false alarm. Cody then asked for my number and we started going out. During the dates, I was so nervous without Halsey and Nola. Okay, Riley, act proper. You're not in your natural habitat. Gosh, you look like an actual princess. Another time, my mouth watered at the burger on the menu, but despite starving, I tried to keep calm and had to order a salad instead. Aw, only a salad? You eat like a little birdie. <sighs> it's exhausting to be a girl. But after all the dates with me, Cody hasn't announced anything official between us. Is it his natural instinct to be flirting with girls? Ugh, Nola's plan's obviously not working. I gotta take matters into my own hands. So I secretly poured some estrogen powder into Cody's protein shake and texted Nola to come see the show. Ha, <laughs> look at the way he dunks the ball. Let's see if he could still be Prince Charming now. 
Later, he clashed with another player, fell to the ground rolling and whimpering in pain like a baby. I was satisfied for today. Suddenly, I saw Declan walking over and he sat right next to me. Oh no, my buddy can't see me in this embarrassing look. Just then, a basketball came hurtling towards me when Declan's quick reflexes got me behind him and caught the ball with his free hand. Are you all right? Yeah, thanks to this. Friend, here. <laughs> Say, what is a pretty girl like you doing in a sports event like this? Thanks for saving my girlfriend. I can handle it from here. Thank God you're okay, Riley. Aw, he's so sweet, so soft and cute. What? Would you stop saying he's soft and cute? He's not that kind of man. You're right. He's a manly man. We're so sorry, Cody. We didn't mean anything by it. Wow, I didn't know such a little girl like you had such a big voice. I'm so happy to have you by my side. Hey, Riley, would you come to the fundraiser carnival with me? I'll make an announcement to everyone there. Wait, was this guy serious? When I got home that night, I saw Declan waiting outside on the porch. I looked at him and then down at my outfit and back to him in panic. So, that really was you back there. So, you really did recognize me. Why didn't you say anything back there? You looked so nervous and acted like you didn't know me, so I didn't want to embarrass you. Anyway, when did you start going out with Cody? Why change so much for him? I explained everything to Declan. The whole revenge plot for Nola and how I'm doing this to get back at Cody for taking away our championship. Well, the Bulldogs were in the wrong for letting you play in the first place. It was a men's final. I don't care. He has to pay for it. Then I stormed inside. I gotta stand my ground. But Nola was there already sitting on my bed. I heard the whole thing. Makes sense now why you were suddenly interested in the plan. Anyway, whatever you're in it for, your main goal is to ruin Cody's reputation. Don't get sidetracked. Okay, guess I have to attend the carnival with Cody then. On the day of the carnival, I saw Cody waiting for me at the entrance. But I couldn't show up looking like this without Halsey. She was dancing her heart out at Coachella, all the way in California. Suddenly, Cody and I locked eyes. I frantically looked for my nearest exit, but Cody was coming quick. Suddenly, I felt an arm wrap around my waist and turn me around. It was Declan? I saw Cody give up and walk away. Other girls were trying to approach him, but he just declined them. Was he still looking for me? Maybe he's not the bad guy Nola painted for me. See, he doesn't deserve the whole revenge plot against him. Yeah, I didn't expect that. He seems to like you a lot, and you should just stop this and be yourself. Declan and I shared a brief moment of silence. Under the sunset glow, Declan looks so charming. Has he always looked like this? You suddenly notice how handsome I am? I mean, yeah, you could be quite a catch. How come no one's tried to sweep you off your feet yet? Maybe they have, but none of them have ever been interesting enough. Besides, I already have eyes for someone else. Huh? Um, I, uh, I need to grab a bite. I'm starving. Bye. Declan's just a buddy I've known for ages. Why was my stomach doing a cartwheel just then? Ah! Oh, it's just you. Mission success. Huh? I just saw Cody post you as his official girlfriend. Nola was right. Cody posted his official announcement about us. Now all you have to do is dump him in public. Nola, I have to tell you something. This has gone on for too long. I'm sick of being someone I'm not. And I don't think Cody's that bad of a guy. He totally is. You're not falling for him, are you? Don't disappoint me, Riley. In the next morning, Nola brought Halsey over, saying it was cultural exchange day today at school. The perfect place and time to dump Cody. Too tired to start a fight with Nola. Ugh, I had to go along with it. At school, I stumbled upon Declan. He asked me to join him in the eating competition. It was kind of awkward after I ran away from him yesterday, but such an attractive offer. How could I say no? Man, I was born to do this. We were the last two standing in the competition, but Declan gave up and I won. I wasn't even thinking and I hugged him automatically. When I realized what I'd done, I let go of him, but my heart was racing. Could it have been the adrenaline of eating 12 huge burritos? After the competition, Declan and I were walking off all the food when we stumbled upon Cody. 12 extra extra large burritos in 15 minutes? You won this? Cody! No, this is his! What are you doing with him? Anyway, you're my girlfriend. You don't even know Riley for who she is. She's mine. Hold on now, guys. What on earth are you talking about? Don't listen to him. Let's go. You're not going with him. What do you mean? Stop! Let go of me! You're annoying me! This guy is so crazy! We gotta go! Now you're telling him I'm crazy? Cody, Riley is the girl you outed during the Bulldogs vs. Knights game. She's just trying to act girly and doing all this to get back at you. Cody was shocked and looked at me waiting. 
Uh, it's true, Cody. I started all this to get back at you. It just seemed so unfair. I'm just as good as any of the boys on the field. I worked my butt off for that game, and I scored the winning goal just to have it stripped away from me. Riley, actually, I was just so stressed that day, and the Knights were losing. But I didn't do it to discriminate against you in the game. I'm so sorry for doing it to you. I was taken aback by his apology. It was so sincere and honest. <laughs> it's a pity. What is? I actually fell so hard for this girly you. Aw, that's sweet, Cody. Tell you what, I'll make it up to you by bringing my real self to prom. And if you like this look right now, I know just who to introduce you to. <laughs> deal. By the way, if I'd known sooner, I wouldn't have acted so poorly towards Declan. He seemed really hurt when he chose my side. I felt horrible about what I'd said to Declan. Even if he didn't agree with what I was doing, he was always there for me. But I acted like my best buddy in the world was a jerk in front of Cody. I was feeling all gloomy in my bedroom when Halsey showed up and asked to sleep over. Whatever, make yourself at home. Just leave me alone, okay? Actually, I can't. I saw the fight this afternoon between Declan and Cody. Gotta say, kinda admire Declan for speaking his heart. Unlike someone. What do you mean? Come on, you like Declan, don't you? Huh? N no, we're just homies. Oh yeah? So what you're feeling for Declan is also the same as the other homies of yours? What Halseed said made me think about recent moments I had with Declan. When he protected me from the basketball, when he held me at the carnival, and when I accidentally hugged him at the competition. My heart acted so weird. My feelings for Declan are definitely different from anyone else. Idiot, you do like him. But what you did this afternoon must have hurt him a lot. What should I do now? Why not ask him to the dance? That's right, I got to redeem myself and make up with Declan, but I still couldn't face him and talk right now. So the next morning, I prepared a letter to send Declan. In the letter, I told him how I realized that I had feelings for him and that I wanted to take him to prom. Then Nola stormed into my room. Why didn't you dump the guy as planned? I explained to her that Cody's actually a confirmed good guy and insisted that she goes to prom. Plus, I had a big surprise for her. I also revealed that I have feelings for Declan and I'm going to send this letter to him. After I told her that, Nola's face perked up and she suggested that she help hand deliver the note just in case Declan was still mad at me. But days passed and I hadn't heard anything from Declan. I guess he was really mad at me and couldn't bring himself to reply to my letter. I really was horrible to him. Halsey came over, cheered me up and suggested that we go to prom together instead. That really cheered me up and I agreed to go with her. She gave me another makeover, but this time it was more natural. I felt more myself. Halsey and I arrived at prom and I was confused and disappointed to see Declan showing up with Nola? Neither of them told me they were going together. Right then, Cody appeared. Hey Riley, you look great. The natural look really suits you. Thanks. Now, I have someone you should meet. Are you happy now, Riley? Being with your so-called enemy? Turns out I didn't know you at all. After I poured my heart out in that letter, he's still so mad at me that he'd attack me like this. I couldn't stand for it, so I fought back and we broke out in an argument. Enough! What is wrong with you, Declan? You didn't reply to her letter and still have the audacity to be mad at her? What letter? Halsey and I turned towards Nola and after a moment of nothing, Nola burst into tears. I hate you, Riley! You promised you'd help me get back at Cody, then you abandoned me completely! So I didn't give the letter to Declan. Nola, I never abandoned you. When I realized that Cody was a good guy, I wanted to reintroduce you to him so you both could have a fresh start. So you were going to introduce me to Nola? You like her style, don't you? Yeah, but she thinks I'm a playboy. And she went as far as to create this whole revenge plot against me. This is all your fault for chasing after me and then dropping me for some other girl. Do you know how disheartening that is? I thought you didn't like me. So I moved on. Back then, I just tried to play hard to get. If only you tried a little harder, I'd have let you know. I didn't understand before, but I get it now. Can we start over? I'd like that. The DJ started to play a slow song, and Declan suddenly pulled me in to dance with him. So that letter, what did it say? It said that I'm sorry for not realizing my feelings earlier. Then I confess my love to you and asked you to prom. Well then, here's my response. Riley, I liked you the minute I set my eyes on you. I wanted to do everything with you. I wanted to hang out, I wanted to play football with you, and I wanted to be by your side every moment of my waking hour. I could never figure out how you felt, so I hid my feelings for you. At that moment, Declan and I were the only two people in the world. We danced throughout the whole night, and I felt complete. And that's why you should just speak your heart, everyone. If you want to hear my story, comment Halsey's story. And I'll see you then. Okay, animators, you can continue.
Why is there a hole here? Could it be that the ants did it? What if they're secretly planning an attack on human beings? Hmm, what will happen to the Big Mac? Elaine, does staring at the hole help you figure out the sphere volume? What class is it? Have you been paying attention at all? Have you? Because if you have, you would have known the answer yourself. Excuse me? Oh, wait. Nah, I still don't know. Sorry, what were you saying? This is going to be in the test. You need to focus if you... Oh, this is Japanese class. Duh. That's it. We're going to the principal's office. And that's the huge of my high school life. Hi, my name's Elaine, and I've been living with ADHD since... I don't know. But of course, ADHD manifests itself differently among different people. For me, I just gotta make sure I take my medication... Wait, where's my birth certificate? Anyway, make sure to like and subscribe before I continue. Right after the principal's office visit, I was walking down the hallway when a hunky guy purposely bumped into me, knocking my bag over. Dude, is that a dinosaur? Are you a kindergartner? <laughs> hey, that's my fidget toy. Give it back. Whoops, finders keepers. Who dares mess with my friend? It's Quinn, the furious queen. Run! The two guys immediately ran for their lives. Right then, Skylar and her new boyfriend also headed over. Isn't she the weirdo from the math class? Don't tell me you're friends with her. Yes, I am indeed. You can only choose one, her or me. How about I dump you instead? Get lost. And these are my girls. We've been best friends since forever and always got each other's backs. I forget my stuff a lot and Quinn always makes sure I got everything with me before leaving any place. While Skylar has me covered every time I dozed off in class. You know, I can't sleep at night because I'm busy thinking about the ant's earth destruction plan. Hmm, maybe they're the ones who terminated the giant dinosaurs. Wait, where was I? I don't know. Rewind the video yourself. Valentine's Day soon arrived. Even though Skylar just broke up with her boyfriend, she already had loads of presents from other guys. And so did Quinn. My girls are hot. What about you, Elaine? Nothing this year yet? Nah, I don't care. You guys are all I need. How about you make a move? Any guy you've laid your eyes on? Talk about making a move. When are you going to tell Cromer you've got the biggest crush on him? That's right. Give it a try today, Quinn. I... I don't care. I can get any guy if I want to. Right. Suit yourself, girl. That afternoon, we were walking when we heard an announcement from the school's radio station. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Malcolm from iHeartRadio. Today, we got a special request from... Someone anonymous delivered to... Elaine Miller. Love the way you stared at the hole on the desk that day in math class. It was so cute. I wish I could be that hole instead. Happy Valentine's Day. Someone's got a crush on you, Elaine. You've got a secret admirer. See, someone likes you for who you are. Always stay true to yourself. I wonder who this is. OMG, I gotta find out. But didn't you say you don't care? That's right. But now the game has changed. <laughs> who could it be? They mentioned math class, so they must attend the same class as we do. That's it. All we need is the attendance list from Mr. Wilson's office. But we can't go in there. Ever heard of mission I'm possible? Girls, it's showtime. After class, we waited for Mr. Wilson to leave his office. Then, just like totally spies, we crawled onto the floor, successfully avoided the security guard's gawking eyes, and managed to hide from one of the teachers passing by. Then continued secretly advancing toward Mr. Wilson's office. Oh, look! They got flaming hot Cheetos now! Elaine! Elaine. After we got the list, I immediately texted a bunch of people to test it out and anxiously waited. But some people replied calling me crazy. Others reported me to Instagram. I even got a visit from the police because they thought I was some creep sliding into people's DMs. Once they left, I immediately FaceTimed the girls. Hmm, from the list, there's still Malcolm you haven't texted. Isn't he working at the radio station with you, Skylar? Yeah, we are working together, but it can't be him. He never asked me about Elaine before. Who knows? You weren't working at the radio station today, were you? My money's on him, Elaine. What should I do? I can't send messages on Instagram anymore. How about writing to him? You know, the old-fashioned way. So I prepared a love letter for Malcolm and even designed a cute envelope for it. But then I got too invested in designing the envelope, I forgot all about the letter. When I finally remembered the letter, I walked all the way back for it. But of course, my ADHD brain had to mess it up again. 
Not until the day when Quinn and Skylar came over and I couldn't find my doctor's envelope anywhere did I realize I'd sent Malcolm my ADHD prescription instead of the letter. We immediately flew to Malcolm's house just as the mailman dropped off the prescription envelope out front. Seeing Malcolm walking out, I frantically ran to the other side of the street and started doing the craziest dance to get Malcolm's attention. Suddenly, I tripped and fell flat on my face. Malcolm rushed to help me up and got me inside his house. We chatted a bit as Malcolm worked on my arm. Elaine, right? We share a few classes together. We do? Yeah, you always sit near Quinn and Skylar, right? I saw you snoozing in class sometimes. Um, I guess so. Look, Malcolm, did you give me the message on the radio? Ah, the confession. Well, it's not me. I'm not your secret admirer. But that doesn't mean I don't have a chance, do I? Skylar talks a lot about you, and I've always wanted to talk to you in person. Um, speaking of Skylar, it's our girls' night tonight. Bye! And thank you. I finally managed to calm my hyperactive heart down when I got back to my room. Is Malcolm the secret admirer? He's not. How embarrassing. See, told you. We're pretty close. He would have told me already. But he seems to like me. Really? I mean, I saw the way he helped you up when you fell. It can't be. Let's focus on finding your real secret admirer. But that doesn't mean I can't hang out with Malcolm while finding my secret admirer. Turned out we both shared a passion for hip hop. He can make super catchy beats for me to rap. Ahem, <laughs> just kidding. Animated story show wouldn't let me. Comment down below if you want a separate video of me rapping. Since then, we started hanging out more often. Malcolm is such a caring and patient person. Sometimes my ADHD kicked in and I cut him off while he was speaking, but he never got mad and just patiently waited for me to finish. Another time when I was blabbing nonstop about whatever was in my mind, I saw him counting. What are you counting for? How many times you switch topics within two minutes? Oh, sorry. No need to. I find it cute, actually. Later on, as we parted ways, I saw Skylar waiting for me, looking a little sad. Hey, what's wrong? I'm gonna be honest with you, because we promised each other. I've actually had a crush on Malcolm ever since we started working together at the radio station. What about your recent boyfriend? Oh, it was just a fling. I just can't stand seeing you with Malcolm. Anyway, don't take it personally. Sorry, I gotta go. Skylar had a crush on Malcolm? But I, I do enjoy being with him. No, sisters first. But it wasn't easy, as Malcolm would always try to approach me. It hurt having to stay away from him. Every time he got close, my heart would beat like crazy. But I also don't want to upset Skylar, as she started distancing herself from me and Quinn. I actually quite like Malcolm. This is so complicated. I honestly don't know what to tell you. How about you try finding your secret admirer? For real this time. He might be a better suit than Malcolm. The next morning, I found a note in my locker. From your secret admirer? They want to meet me near the fountain. But when I got there, I saw another note asking me to come to the bleacher. This better not be some silly prank. When I arrived, I was shocked to see Cromer sitting there by himself. He can't be behind the notes, right? Guess I'll find out now. Just a little closer. Closer. Suddenly, he looked up and stared straight into the camera. I was about to run when he caught me. Hey, Elaine Miller, right? You could have asked me for a picture. Didn't know you have a thing for me. No, no, I... I... It was an accident! Since then, I made sure to be more discreet to see if Cromer was the secret admirer. But man, it's like this guy got the sixth sense or something. Hey, what's wrong? You look nervous. It's because she likes me. She even tried to take pictures of me, right, Elaine? It's okay. I noticed you watching me recently. Come on, just admit it. I know I'm irresistible. <laughs> Why are you doing this? You know I like him. No, no, let me explain. You know, I even thought it was a misunderstanding between you and Skylar. But you know what? Now it seems like you just want to steal from us. Hey, guys, chill out. What's going on? You chill out. Do you even know Elaine said she liked Malcolm too? And now she's also taking Cromer. My Cromer. Hey, about Cromer, it's not what you think. And Malcolm, it's not like you and him are a thing. I have as much of an equal chance as you do, don't you think? Then why were you following him just then? And you even took pictures of him? And we're talking about our chance with Malcolm now? I, I, uh, you know it's unfair to me. Unfair? We're always trying to make sure to put you first, but now you think you're the victim? I can't do this anymore. I hope you're happy you got both guys now, best friend. That was too much. They acted as if they took pity on me. I don't need anyone to look after me. I'm all fine by myself.
Since we fell out, we're all caught up with our own things. Whenever I passed by Skylar, she just gave me a cold look. Quinn also seemed to have found new joys. I managed to get by just fine, but it felt like something was missing. One time, I was walking when I spotted Skylar and Malcolm surrounded by a crowd. Turned out, Skylar confessed having a crush on Malcolm and asked him out, but he rejected her. The crowd couldn't miss the chance to mock her. Suddenly, I remembered how Skylar used to stand up for me, and I felt so bad for her. So, I decided to defend her this time, but she just ran out of there. I tried to catch up with her, but Skylar wouldn't listen. Suddenly, she crossed the street without looking, and a car came crashing into her. I frantically ran to check on her, and we immediately got her to the ER. Thank God she was fine. Just a couple bruises and scratches, but she refused to let me in. That night, I tried to call Quinn, but it kept sending me to voicemail. But I've made up my mind. I kept ringing her bell and insisted on waiting till she showed up. She finally gave in. Hey, I'm sorry for- Oh, you're sorry for me? No need to take pity on me. Just enjoy your happiness. Malcolm rejected me because he chose you. Happy much? Now just leave me alone, you ruthless, self-centered. Then she slammed the door shut in front of me, leaving me all stunned there. Ha, huh, what a show. This should totally be on Netflix. Kramer, why are you here? I live right next door, so I see Skylar doesn't want to see you. But I do. Get off of me! I never liked you! Are you playing hard to get now, pretty little thing? Right then, Malcolm appeared out of nowhere and bolted to punch Kramer in the face. Didn't you hear what she said? Leave her alone! Can't believe Quinn and I are arguing because of you, creep! If only Quinn knew who her crush truly was! Quinn likes me? Huh! Could have told me earlier! What else is he up to? Anyway, thank you. Why are you here? I heard Skylar got into an accident right after the, uh, incident, so I wanted to pay her a visit. Now that you're here, I just want to let you know, uh, actually, the one sending you the confession on the radio that day was... Skylar. What? She just wanted you to feel loved and not left alone on Valentine's Day. I was gonna give it some time before telling you, but things got... complicated all too quickly. Anyway, now that you don't have to find out who your secret admirer is anymore, would you want to go out with me? As a girlfriend, I mean. Malcolm, I do like you a lot, but I just can't bring myself to hurting Skylar ever again. I'm sorry. Ugh, it's okay. I understand. Guess I'll see Skylar another time then. I'm so sorry, Malcolm. Later, I arrived home to Mom packing some boxes. Can you check if you still need these from the attic? Otherwise, they have to go. I opened up the boxes to find old pictures of me, Skylar, and Quinn inside, and I immediately burst into tears. We looked so happy together, like nothing could split us apart. That's right, we're sisters. I gotta make things right. The next day, after the first period, I came looking for Skylar. Gosh, I'm so anxious. Where's my fidget toy? What if Skylar's still mad at me? Looking for this? Y yes Skylar, I need to talk- Me too. I'm sorry, Elaine. Uh, I was so hurt and embarrassed yesterday that I said nasty things to you. And you were right. I should have told you earlier I have a crush on Malcolm, but after everything, I realized how stupid I was and I don't want to lose you or lose us. Hey, me too. I couldn't sleep yesterday after hearing about everything from Skylar. I haven't been myself without you guys. Oh, me neither. You guys mean the world to me. It turned out Skylar also gave me the locker notes that day. She said she wanted me to give up on finding a secret admirer and Cromer just happened to be there. After that, I also told Quinn and Skylar about the fight between Cromer and Malcolm that night when Cromer himself showed up. Hey, Quinn. I just realized I've always liked you. I'm sorry your friend Elaine liked me, but you are my perfect match. Be my girlfriend, will you? Skylar and I immediately gave each other a worried look when Cromer, you know what Lady Gaga would say? Caught in a bad romance? I know I'm too handsome. You can't resist. She'd say, Women stick together, you jerk. Cromer immediately ran away in embarrassment. <laughs> what a loser. Oh, by the way, Malcolm left to study abroad today and he sent his goodbye to you. I feel so bad about you and Malcolm. It's okay. Right person, wrong time. From then on, us three were always by each other's side and graduated together. We even went to the same college now and made sure we go to every party together. One night at a music festival, I was waiting for Skylar and Quinn to get back from the restroom when they started playing Kendrick Lamar. Hip-hop would always remind me of someone now. Suddenly, a handkerchief was handed to me. I saw you from afar. Is this the right time to get your number now? I was 
sound asleep. When loud bangings jolted me awake, the cops busted in and immediately pinned me down. What are you doing? Let me go! Get away from me! Do you even know who I am? Rebecca Darlington, you're under arrest for stealing Mr. Woodley Jones's heirloom necklace. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Stealing? What? No, I didn't do it. Let me go. Man, I got into big trouble that time. Oh, hey guys, I'm Rebecca. Believe it or not, it's actually my bizarre life story here. Before we start, please like and subscribe. My dad passed away when I was only five, so my mom had to step up and take over the entire family business on her own. And she was the biggest perfectionist on the planet, not just in business, but in the family too. Seriously, it's her way or no way. I hated this and always tried to rebel. However, mom always found a way to ruin my fun and forced me to study business instead. Ah, <sighs> boring. But lucky me, my brother, Kevin, always got my back. One morning over breakfast, mom decided to drop a bombshell on me. Rebecca, I've arranged you a date with Brian, the Woodley Jones's son. You are to go there for dinner and be on your best behavior. They are very affluent. They own half of the city. No chance. I'm not some pawn in your bid to gain business deals. If you ignore my orders, I'll transfer you to a boarding school all the way to Australia. You wouldn't. Don't test me, young lady. Perhaps you could arrange this date for another time when Rebecca has a time to digest it? If I wanted your input, I would have asked for it. He's my brother, and he has a say in this. Your adopted brother. It's about time he knows his place. Kevin looked so hurt, but still put a smile on for me. He's such an angel, just like his mom, Rosalie. Rosalie used to work here as a maid, and Kevin would often come play with me. But then she suddenly passed away, leaving Kevin all alone in this world. So mom adopted him out of pity. To me, Kevin's always been a family, and I will not let mom treat him like that. How about I let her have a taste of her own medicine? So I took mom's magic money card and went on a huge shopping splurge. Mom wouldn't be mad if her card missed a few zeros, right? Now let's get ready for the date. Ta-da! I look crazy, right? Take that, mom. No way will this Brian guy want a second date. Kevin kindly offered to drive me to my date. He reassured me it would be okay, then passed me a box of chocolates to give to Brian. Ugh, oh, Kevin. It was gone 9 p.m. when I strolled into the grand entrance hall of the Woodley Joneses mansion. Brian's jaw dropped to the floor as soon as he saw my crazy look. Oh, but I didn't stop there. I first asked all the surfers to leave us alone, then made him nauseous with my table manners and wowed him with my big appetite. I even sneaked bites of the chocolates meant for him and playfully fed him some. After dinner, I asked him to give me a tour of the mansion. But by the time we reached the jewelry room, my head was spinning. Then everything went blurry and I blacked out. The next morning, I was already back at my house without any memories of how I got back. Then these cops came in and arrested me. Now I'm in this interrogation room being accused of stealing the Woodley Jones necklace. Apparently, it was quite pricey and had been handed down through 12 generations. You were at the scene of the crime. If you want to prove your innocence, then I suggest you start telling me what happened. Like I said, I went there for dinner, then fainted, and somehow woke up in my bed with cops everywhere. Stop lying. Brian was the one who was drugged, during which time you cut off the power so you wouldn't be caught on CCTV, then stole the necklace, didn't you? Okay, Mr. Policeman. Daniel Wright, I know you're trying to play good cop, bad cop with me, so I'll get to the point. Let me go, and I will ask my mom to pay you handsomely. You know her, right? Head of the Darlington conglomerate? Are you trying to bribe to law enforcement? You could get seven years in jail for this, plus the robbery sentence. I can assure you it wouldn't be less than ten years. T ten years? I, I didn't mean to. I just freaked out. I I'm rich, okay? I have everything I want. I, I wouldn't risk stealing something like that. You did send all the staff home, so there's no one to corroborate your story. How exactly did you get home? I told you I blacked out. All I know is I didn't do anything wrong. You couldn't find the necklace at my place or on me either. You have no evidence against me. Then enjoy a stay in a cell for 24 hours, in which time I shall find the proof I need to lock you away for a very long time. Wait, no, please trust me. Someone, anyone. This was so unfair. I just wanted to go home. Fortunately, that cop couldn't find any proof and had to let me go. Finally, after 24 hours behind cold bars, unjustly accused, all I need right now is a warm welcome from Mom and Kevin and a nice bath. But what I got was a slap in the face. How could you steal from the Woodley Joneses? Now they'll never do business with me again. Mom, I didn't do it. Why does nobody believe me? 
Would you look at yourself? Have you done anything good for this family? All you ever did was party, throw my hard-earned money out the window, then dare to cross me. You're no daughter of mine. Get out, now! I was shocked and heartbroken by her words. My own mother wouldn't believe me? So, I walked out. Just you wait, Mom. I'll prove it to you. I'm no thief. With Kevin's help, I rented a place not too far from home, but it was nowhere near the luxury I was used to. No worries. Once I proved myself innocent, things would get better. Now I just had to find that police guy, Daniel, that arrested me. He must have insight on the case, right? But when I arrived at the police station, I saw Daniel being scolded by his boss. You couldn't even solve the simplest case. Daniel, what has gotten into you? You're off the case. Jack, it's over to you. Leave it with me, sir. I won't let you down. Like some incompetence. <laughs> Sheesh, that Jack guy was such a douchebag. And Daniel sure did look glum about all of this. So I approached him and suggested we work together to find the culprit and kick Jack in the butt. At first, he refused, as apparently a suspect participating in the investigation was not procedure. Relax, it's not like I want access to classified documents or anything. Think of it as working with a suspect. If we cooperate, you can monitor me to see if I really am the culprit. It's a win-win. It's not like that. I'm no longer on the case. Jeez, I didn't expect you to give up so easily. So much for being a pro. Maybe your boss was right to reassign the case. <laughs> Who are you to judge me? You're still the number one suspect in this case, and I got my eyes on you, thief. So, is that a yes? Ugh, fine. Bingo. Surely there's no place better to hunt for clues than the crime scene, right? But Brian's mansion was locked down and had security everywhere. Luckily, Daniel told me he'd already studied the house's layout and knew that the only way to intrude without being noticed was through this door. Yes, folks, you heard it right. A dog door. The bar couldn't get any lower, could it? Just shut up. We sneaked through it and ended up in the staff kitchen. The main building has already been fully swept, as that's where we knew the main suspect was. The staff quarters weren't a focus point. Daniel launched into a CSI mode, checking the area for footprints, and I watched with fascination. He found a strange shoe print, which didn't belong to any of the staff, as they were required to wear uniform shoes. This type of shoe print is rare. This could be a big clue. I didn't want him to start accusing me again, so I wiggled my foot about. Ahem, <clears throat> it's obviously not my tiny size six feet. <laughs> I didn't say a thing about you. This obviously belonged to a man with size 12 feet. Is it your accomplice? Is he Bigfoot or something? Are you crazy? Who's accomplice, you madcap? Shush, are you trying to get us caught? Oopsie, just then, we heard running footsteps coming our way. Shoot, we gotta get out. The only escape is through this window. Again? Oh, what a burden. Daniel grabbed my hand, then we both jumped through the window. Smack, his shoe was right up my face. Ouch, get your dirty foot off me. I tried getting up and we ended up kissing. My my first kiss. Wait, what is that sound? I turned around to see two big dogs growling at us. We run on the count of three, okay? One, just run! We ran straight to the road and caught a taxi, leaving behind those vicious dogs. Uh, your hand, um. Oh, sorry, it was because of those dogs. Is being chased by dogs the in-trend? A few nights ago, I saw those exact two dogs chasing another man along this road. Daniel immediately asked the driver to show him his dashcam footage. It showed this tall, masked man in all black coming out of Brian's house. A shiver ran through me at the sight of him. There was something unsettlingly familiar. The next day, Daniel made me traipse into at least a dozen different shoe stores so he could ask the staff about the soul print we'd found last night, but no luck. The scorching sun was getting to me, so Daniel brought out this umbrella. Cute, huh? If only this big hole hadn't been directly above me. By lunchtime, I saw Daniel sweating in the heat, so I grabbed a tissue to wipe for him. The heat rose as we were so close, but once done, he was even more oily. <laughs> we were just like two peas in a pod. Later that day, we made it to this ancient shoe shop that said it was a Leighton, a brand that made customized handmade shoes. Wait, I've heard about that exclusive brand before, but... If someone could afford these shoes, why would they go out and about stealing? Daniel seemed to agree, and the investigation was at a dead end. The truth is, I had my suspicions about who the real thief was, so I went back to the crime scene to see if I could find any evidence. Daniel did say this dog door was the only other way in, so I searched around the area and spotted this shiny bracelet in a bush. Oh, I know who this belongs to. So, I've asked him to meet me here. I found your bracelet. Thank you so much. You know how important this is to me. The bracelet is a keepsake for my mom. She gave it to me before she passed away. 
I found it at Brian's house. The night you drove me to Brian's, did you go straight home afterward? Y yeah, of course. I've been on the investigation for a couple of days and found that the thief wore size 12 latent shoes. I gave you a pair for your birthday. The thief was also identified by a taxi driver's dash cam as a male, around 5 foot 10, the exact body figure of you. And now, this bracelet? The coincidences are stacking up, but I can't believe it. Not without your explanation. After all, you are my brother. Yes, it was me, but I had no other choice. I actually have a sister, a half-sister from my dad's side, and she's going through surgery. I really needed the money to pay her bills. I might look successful on the outside, but I work for your mom unpaid. Don't get me wrong, I'm grateful for all she's done for me, and I couldn't ask her for more, so I took the risk. Why didn't you tell me? I can help you. You were always embroiled in arguments with your mom, so I don't want to burden you further. And you only seem to need me when you're in trouble. That's… true. Thinking back, we rarely talked. Even when we talked, it was always me complaining about mom to him without realizing mom has been the hardest on him. I hated what he did, but I knew he only did it to save his sister, and I felt terrible that I'd had Kevin's love and care all of these years, and she hadn't. Kevin, don't worry. Just leave it to me. The next day, Daniel came to see me and told me the police department had just found new evidence against me. The chocolates I'd given to Brian that night contained anesthetics. It all sounds very suspicious to me and may just change the direction of my investigation. Are you investigating me now? No, it's highly possible that the real culprit wanted to target you. I need your cooperation. We have to hurry before they blame it all on you. Who helped you prepare the present that day? No one. I bought them at the store. I felt awful lying to Daniel, but I couldn't let Kevin go down for this. Not when his sister needed him. It was time for me to put an end to this devastating chain of events. I went to the police station and confessed to stealing the necklace. They arrested me, and right at that moment, Daniel stepped in, surprised. Rebecca, what are you doing here? Let her go! What are you doing? We can't arrest her without evidence. Daniel, it's okay. I already confessed. What? That's nonsense. I insisted that I did it, and he had no choice but to let them arrest me. I know it's not that simple, Rebecca, and I'm going to prove it. Daniel was right. Everything was off about this trial. First, this Jack guy had somehow swapped all the evidence against Kevin to me, from my shoe prints on the staff kitchen to the recording from the taxi driver. Plus, the necklace was later found in Miss Rebecca Darlington's bedroom. It was never there in the first place. I wanted to speak up for myself, but that douchebag Jack shut me up. The judge was about to sentence me when Daniel kicked the door and barged in. Stop, Your Honor. I believe all the evidence presented to you was faked by him. The whole court bursted out in surprise. Turns out Daniel's boss had suspected Jack was a rotten apple, so he actually wanted to use this chance to expose him. He pretended to kick Daniel out of the case and appointed Jack instead to lure him into the trap. As predicted, after I confessed to the crime, Daniel followed Jack and saw that he was taking bribes from Kevin. Well paid. I'll fake the evidence. Rebecca will go down for this. Don't mess it up. It's tricky enough to get that brat to take the blame for me. He played me? There was no half-sister who's in the hospital? Ugh, don't look at me like that. My real mom only died because of your mom, Don Darlington. That woman flagrantly accused her of stealing. Mom was so distraught, she had a heart attack and and passed away. Dawn only adopted me out of guilt, and she treated me like garbage, making me run around for you. So I decided to take revenge, show them how being wrongly accused of something can ruin lives. But look where vengeance got him. He was a monster, and I really wondered, was it really worth it? In the end, both Jack and Kevin went to jail. Unfortunately, without Kevin as key personnel to help out with my family business, it went into turmoil. So I offered to help mom with it. You do that after everything I put you through. We're a family. I also felt bad for taking you and what you provide me for granted. I'm so ashamed of how I treated you. I've been cold, controlling, and unfair on you and Kevin. It's my fault he turned against us and sought revenge. Mom, it must have been hard for you running the business and caring for me and Kevin, especially without Dad. I forgive you and want to just put it behind us and start again. Now, I just had one last person to make amends with. Rebecca, I... I didn't think you'd ever want to see me again. I didn't. I was so mad, but then I realized that being that way was getting me nowhere. To forgive others means forgiving and liberating ourselves. I walked out of the prison feeling much more positive about it all and saw Daniel waiting for me. Say, we make a good team. What do you think about being my partner? Partner? For investigative purposes or for life? Hmm, how about both?
Hey, it's me again, Amy. Last time we spoke, I had made a huge discovery. But before we get to that, let me just remind you how we got here. My father's death left me completely devastated. So mom suddenly convinced me to travel to take my mind off of it. But instead of having a good time, I accidentally got stranded on this exotic island that's owned by a native tribe who do not like barners. Luckily, I met Silas, who helped me survive here, and we actually have gotten pretty close. <laughs> We're having so much fun that for a second I forgot that I had to go back, until I heard the rumor that my accident could have been staged. Would my own mother really have caused me to end up here? I needed to go home immediately to find out, and Silas was willing to help with all his might, but it's been a few days, and I haven't heard anything back from him. I waited eagerly, then impatiently for him to come. Finally, one afternoon, I heard a noise outside. I quickly went down to check. To my surprise, it wasn't Silas. It was Nora, and as usual, she looked annoyed to see me. I tried to tell her Silas wasn't here, but she pushed past me anyway and grabbed a stick to draw something. What are you doing? Abstract art? There. Island. I see. People. Then I got it. There is an island? With people? Can we get there? Yes. Can. Go. We can take a boat there? She nodded again and signaled me to follow her. Oh my god! I jumped with excitement! Maybe I was wrong about her. Nora led me to the shore, where she uncovered a small boat hidden behind a bush. Go away! Now! Go! Go! Nora pulled me towards the boat, sat me down, and started pushing the boat towards the water. Isn't it a little late to sail now? Wind! Wind faster! As we reached the edge of the tide, I realized, Wait! I need to tell Silas I'm leaving! Nora immediately became frustrated. Silas! With Dad! Danger! I didn't quite believe her, but I also didn't know if I'd get another chance like this. I couldn't imagine leaving Silas behind without a goodbye. I felt a pit in my stomach, but we will meet again someday. Definitely. Our family has all the money to rescue him later. Just hang on a bit more, hun. I'll go get help. Nora kept pushing me, and she's right. The patrol could detect me at any moment. So I started paddling away. See you again, Silas. But I only managed to go for a few feet, and then it's like my boat got stuck on something. I turned around to see. Silas? What do you think you're doing? Hey, Nora said that there is an inhabited island nearby, and I didn't want to miss the chance. Get off the boat. It's too dark and too dangerous to go out there by yourself. I'll go and check it out first and come back by morning to let you know if it's safe. Stay here. I was confident in his sailing ability, but it seemed Nora wasn't. She ran to cling to his arm, begging him not to go. Still, he ignored her and got on the boat. Nora glared at me before storming off, but I stayed on the shore for a moment, watching Silas disappear into the dark sea. Soon enough, the winds grew stronger and the rain started coming down hard. The storm lasted through the night. I stayed up, waiting in the cave where I spent my first night on the island. The rain stopped by dawn. I couldn't sit still and kept marching back and forth along the shore, looking for any signs of Silas. Nora returned soon after, yelling at me in her native tongue. I didn't understand anything she was saying, but I knew she was just as worried for Silas as I was. He'll be back soon, safe and sound. I trust him. And moments later, there he really was, coming back to shore. I couldn't help but run up and hug him as soon as he stepped out of the boat. I asked if he was okay and how he dealt with the rain, and Silas answered all of my questions with a tight hug. But soon we were interrupted by Nora. She shouted angrily and then stormed off. Silas chased after her and said some things that seemed to calm her down. That island is actually your family's gem mine. I've let them know that their boss lady is alive and well and ready to go home. Oh my god, really? They have their ship ready just a bit further offshore since it's dangerous to get close to the island, you know. Just sail out a little bit and they'll pick you right up. Yay, I'm finally leaving. We're finally... Silas stopped walking and looked at me sadly. Come on, let's go. I can't go with you. Nora will only let you go peacefully if I stay here. If I try to leave with you, she'll tell her father. My heart sank. We'll see each other again, I promise. How? Where there's a will, there's a way. Silas squeezed my hand and then let me go. I tried not to look back at him as I got onto the boat and set sail. I traveled for what could have been a few minutes or a few hours. I couldn't tell anymore until I was finally spotted by a larger vessel. They set out a lifeboat for me and once on board, I was well taken care of by everyone, offered food and warm clothes. But first thing first, I had to contact my family. I called home and the person on the other end was my grandmother. She's as surprised to hear my voice as me hearing hers. Turns out, after all the shenanigans that happened after my father's death, my grandma had moved into our house to take care of things and wait for my return. We cried for a good 10 minutes, and then I told her not to worry. I was safe, and that I'd be home soon. 
When I got home, Grandma, Nanny Emma, and my sister Briona rushed to greet me. As my sister hugged me tightly, I realized how much I had truly missed them, and also realized that my mom was really nowhere to be seen. No one made any mention of her in any way. I worked up the nerve to ask my grandma about her. Right when the police said there were signs of foul play in your disappearance, I already got suspicious. Then when Emma said it was your mother who suggested you go there and play those silly games, I immediately kicked her out. People are truly full of surprises. Do you really think Mom was masterminding all this? She was really trying to get both of you. Briona was lucky she forgot her passport. Don't be glum, dear. You still have me and Briona and Emma, too. We all love you and care about you very much. Now, go have some rest. It must have been a long journey for you. The next day, as soon as I got up, I went looking for my sister to confirm the things Grandma had said. When I found her, I couldn't stop the tears from spilling out. How could Mom have been the one to do this? Why would she do something like this to her own children? Amy, never listen to a story from one side only. Huh? Do you know something I don't know? Just don't jump into conclusions yet. She then excused herself to work and hurriedly left before I could ask anything else. I kept thinking about what Briona said, but couldn't come up with any other speculation. As I passed my parents' room, I noticed a box sitting outside the door. It's full of my mother's belongings. Nanny Emma is probably packing my mom's stuff out of here. Something in the box caught my eye. I opened it up and found that it was a photo album of me since I was a kid. And next to each picture is some love notes. This is definitely my mom's handwriting. My eyes landed on a photo of myself playing the piano. And my mother wrote, Sweet Pea playing my favorite song. She meant so well, but I was always the ungrateful, rebellious one. Was that why she stopped loving me? Did I do anything that terrible for her to want me gone? I suddenly missed her. I found myself taking the photo up to the piano room, some place I've never gone voluntarily. But as I reached for the doorknob, I heard voices coming from the inside. I peeked through the ajar door. Stop it! It's lucky enough that you didn't get caught. Just get out of here before it's too late. And throw all of my effort in vain? No way! My plan was going so well! How on earth could she survive? So, plan B. You need to secure that spot in the board of directors before Amy gets in the way, and I'll take care of the rest. But, oh god, them? They were behind all this? That night, I waited until I had everyone together to make an exciting announcement. Tomorrow, I'm officially going to start working for the company. I've been working on a proposal to pitch to the board of directors to gain their approval. That's wonderful, dear. Don't you think you need some sort of rest, sweetheart? You went through a big ordeal, and I'm ready. I'm totally fine. Well, Briona will also be returning to the company, and I'm glad I'll be able to help her out. The more hands, the better. I'm so glad you want to join the company. Later that evening, Nanny came into my room with a warm glass of milk. Oh, Emma, you always take such good care of me. Well, tomorrow's going to be a big day, and you need to get a good night's rest. Thank you. Finish your milk before it gets cold, sweetie. Good night. I hugged the warm milk glass and smiled at her as she walked out. Okay, one last revision and then I'll go prepare my outfit for tomorrow. But my eyes, so tired. Suddenly, I was woken up by a sound at the door. Then it slowly opened, followed by footsteps. Someone is walking towards me. She's looking for my documents. Aha! Time to wrap up your play, Emma. Oh, sweetie, go to sleep properly in bed. I'll, I'll help you tidy up. Cut the act, you witch. What do you think you're going to find here? My presentation for tomorrow? Joke's on you, it's a trap. But the milk, you've drank it all. You mean the glass of milk flavored hypnotic? I've poured it down the drain. Sorry, suddenly felt lactose intolerant. Bold of you to think you can fool me in my own house. I've seen everything, but why do you want to take me down that bad? Emma, aren't we? Because my daughter, Briona, deserves this company more than you. Before I could even process that information, Emma was rushing towards me holding a chloroform-soaked rag. Just as she backed me into a corner, the door flew open. My grandma and Briona rushed in, followed by the police, who restrained Emma right away. Briona ran over yelling, I told you I didn't want any part in your schemes. I would never ever hurt my sister. Briona? Did you know she was your real mother already? Not until after mom was gone, then Emma told me everything. Sensing my confusion, Briona explained that Emma had a fling with our father many years ago, but he wouldn't marry her because of her lesser status. She was already pregnant with Briona at the time, so our father allowed her to stay as a nanny. When my mom married our dad, she only knew that Briona was her husband's stepchild. I'm sorry I didn't come clean sooner. I didn't know what to do. 
because I didn't realize how far she was willing to go. But when I saw her messing with your drink, I knew that I needed to at least warn you. Thank you for always being on my side and telling the truth now. It must have been even harder for you to process all these. But don't worry, we can still make this right. Emma was trying to explain away her crimes as the police escorted her away in handcuffs. They assured as justice would be served. We got in touch with mom, and by morning she was back home. After some more crying and apologizing and explaining and hugging, everything was as close to normal as it could be. I admitted that I didn't want the responsibility of running the company, but there was something I did want. I wanted to return to the Gem Island and oversee the exploration of the new mines. What I didn't say was the reason I really wanted to return. He was all I could think about as I embarked on my journey back to the island. We took a big boat as far as we could, before I needed to board a paddle boat to remain undetected once we reached native territory. Before I knew it, the island appeared on the horizon. My heart fluttered as I paddled faster and faster, waiting for the moment I could finally see Silas again. I was so focused on the land ahead that I didn't see the huge wave coming up from behind and overturned my boat. When I opened my eyes, I once again thought I was dead. This time, it was because the first thing I saw was an angel's face. Silas. Amy. Hi. I told you we'd see each other again. <laughs> but my moment in heaven was interrupted by the tribe's return. We were surrounded by the natives hollering and pounding their spears into the ground. A man angrier and more distinctively dressed than the rest stepped forward. This must be the chief. He shouted something to the others, and they grew quiet. He shouted some more, and all of their spears were pointed at me and Silas. I looked up at Silas. His face didn't change. He hugged me even tighter. Just when I thought the end was near, I heard a familiar voice. Nora was standing in between us and her father, shouting desperately. The chief's expression softened, and after some discussion between them, the chief gave another order, which made Silas very surprised. So, yes. Thanks to Nora and all the good deeds that Silas has done for the tribe. They spared our lives, but they ordered us both to leave their territory right away. So Silas and I moved to the main island, where my family's gem mine is located. Here we still have the beauty and simplicity of the wild lifestyle, while being connected to the rest of the world and helping manage our family business. So it's okay that we're not allowed to stay on the tribe's island. Not to mention, we still have a friend who often comes to visit. Nora had nagged her father to allow her to come over to our island every few days. It was at first because of Silas, but I think that she has set her sights on someone new now. <laughs>